And we're live. Uh, thank you everyone so much for coming and watching uh, tonight's live stream. This is a very exciting one for me. I, I've been doing tutorial videos for quite a while on my channel. I love doing them. For those of you that have watched a lot of my tutorials, and thank you for that if you have, um, so much of what I know really is, is just a result of, of working and, and looking at other artists and, and kind of trying to intuit. I haven't really done a lot of systematizing what I know and, and really, you know, deep study. And that's, that's something that, um, that I, I've been trying to work on lately, especially doing my videos. And in doing that, I found an incredible uh, author of so many great books on force throughout the body. Um, I showed him actually on the channel. Uh, this is a little while ago. We, we showed one of his books and, and, uh, you know, talked about it and did some drawing from it and everything. And, and, um, uh, he's not only an incredible artist, but he takes the things that he does so well and he explains it in a way that you can do it too. And I can do it too. And I've tried it and it really, it makes an immediate difference and I understand it. And that's really the most important thing. So I am so incredibly excited to be able to have Michael Matessi here with us. Uh, we're going to be talking about Force Fabric tonight. We're really going to be focusing on that one. That's Mike's uh, new book, um, which I'm very excited for. And I've done fabric tutorials on the channel. And I was just, we were talking before we started. I don't know what I'm doing. So when I do those tutorials, I feel like I'm, I'm really, really faking it. Maybe more some other things. So I, I'm so happy that, Mike, you were willing to come on and, and do this with us to really explain to the audience uh, why all the things work with folds uh, the way that they do and how to make it powerful in a drawing. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me, David. I, I appreciate it. And um, I have heard about you mentioning my book in the past um, from other artists and students. So thank you so much for uh, sharing that with your audience. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, you know, I, I, I was telling David earlier this week, um, what actually got me into art into art school was comics. I actually wanted to become a comic book artist myself. Um, I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York and I was telling uh, David how um, and Eric how uh, I had Will Eisner, you know, as a teacher in my senior year and how fortunate I was to have someone like him and Gene Colan and Klaus Janssen, a bunch of these like just heavy hitters in the industry. And I was really ready to push into that. And um, ironically, uh, animation, I just got into animation before comics and that kind of changed the course of my life. So. Uh, I still collect comics. I love comic book artists. I, I think it's one of the um, one of the most challenging fields there is from a skill standpoint. So, man, I just respect comic book guys, you know, and girls, right? It's just like super, super hard, super deep skill set of you know composition, clothing, figure drawing, um, anatomy, light and shadow, <laughs> coloring. It's like pretty much everything that you possibly need to know as an artist is in comic storytelling. Right? It's not even forget about the performance and the storytelling. It's ironic so, that just with a pencil, you comic artists are really kind of a jack of all trades in a lot of ways yeah. for, for art, even though it's it's just a pencil. There are just so many different skills that go into it for sure. Yeah, I mean it's 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 and I and I love it. You know, it's it's most I think the craft most similar is probably like storyboarding, you know, for a film or animation. But there, you know, they they at least have a locked frame, right? In comics, you have the ability to manipulate the frame to further story, right? Yes. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a really powerful medium. And uh, anyway, I just want you all to know how much I adore comic book artists. And I'm really happy to be here today. I'm very excited to share with you guys uh, this newest book, which just came out in October, which is called Force Fabric, as David mentioned. Um, I also want to make really clear that um, I'm the writer and editor. Um, and I did some of the drawing. But one of my other Force instructors, who was somebody I trained up over the years, Martin J. Varun, uh, he did a, actually a vast amount of the drawing for this book, and he and I are on another book also, and that's helping me be able to get these books out to you guys faster because he's taking on a lot of the brunt of the work of the drawing, and I know I can trust him because I trained him up. Like, he knows what he's doing, Yeah. right? So it's helping me work more quickly and get more books out to you, more content out to you. There are drawings of mine in there, and you'll see them uh, today as well, but Mutunje was an amazing um asset to uh to helping this happen in the first place so anyway um yeah i'm ready when you guys are ready to move right. forward i wanted to mention too we got a comment from yeah. uh, abbott who said uh can you ask michael to show us how to make uh, a cape realistic and graphically pleasing and we're going to be covering that i think so that's a we great will. question <laughs> yes 
Yeah, we will. We have so much stuff to cover. I'm going to try to give you as much information as I can today. And as David said, I think good information is like actionable information, you know? So for me, I, I kind of judge the books. I read the educational ones based on like, wow, I can take that and I can use it like right now, right? Anywhere from advertising to marketing to self-help books, art books. It's like, to me, a valuable book is one I can literally just take something and, and use it. So I'm going to try to do that for you guys today. And hopefully um, you'll leave here today with a much clearer understanding on how to draw fabric, right? Absolutely. Well, I, for me, I think, oh, sorry, Eric, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, Russ has pasted in the chat um, that for, uh, for anyone watching here, they can get 20% off uh, Mike's new new book, Force Fabric, on his, on his website. So I would definitely take advantage of that. Yes. Yes, yeah, you can get yeah. it on Amazon. But if you go directly to Mike's website, you get 20% off, which is... Yep which is nice. Yeah, and and Russ, <laughs> Russ, has the, Russ has the coupon code there as well. Yes, that's right. Thank you, guys. So talk about the website before we go into all this, not to sound too much like a used car salesman. Um, uh, because I'm here, I try to always come up with really awesome offers when I'm being invited to a space like this with David. Um, we have a standard membership. Uh, that membership is once a month. Uh, it's thirty dollars a month, but I'm going to throw in the force brush pack and the model pack. That means, and that comes to about twenty-seven dollars, which means for the first month you're only paying three dollars really to get access to all of the videos on the site. That's um, force basics, uh, form and anatomy, to be more specific. And that's this um, this link. And then the second link is, and this is the big one. I think this is where my website is most powerful. Is Swenley Mertunje and I, all the force instructors. Uh, we all teach in one-on-one -on -one sessions. Most of my life is me teaching people online, right? Like I had about five or six sessions today of teaching. They're one-hour sessions. That's where you get the most traction uh, mm -hmm. because I'm giving you homework. You come back the next week. I'm telling you what's working, what's not working. And we keep doing that, right? And it's individualized. So for the 36, if you pay for the 36-session package, I'm throwing in something called the Elite Membership, or I'm calling Elite Bundle here, but it's the Elite Membership. Elite membership on drawingforce.com is usually $800. So I'm throwing that in for free. And what that means is you have forever lifetime access to the website, even new stuff that's coming on. And there's, as I was telling David before we came on today, there's at least two or three new courses that are going to be coming up this year. Oh, and so you'll get just, access to that. That's just this year. You've been doing this for so long now that uh, this isn't something where a year from now you're going to decide hey you know um, i'm going to do something else and and everybody that has that now is out of luck this is something you know you have a long long track record and it's going to be years and years of uh support and content so it's a, it's a great offer yes thank you yeah years and years of feeling that <laughs> <laughs> yeah we all are <laughs> yeah you said years and years and I'm like that's every year that you said there is probably about a decade so i'm probably about 25 30 years into this at this point yeah uh, yeah. yeah, 30 years for me this year. 30 yeah. years in. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal. So anyway, so that's all the discounts. I'll, I'll, I'll go very quickly over this at the very, very end again, just to recap. But um, let's get to it, right? So we're here to talk about clothing. And what I want to share with you guys is how this all starts, right? So first of all, there's force. Like, what does that mean? Um, I found as I was writing the books that it came down to like a line. If I can draw with a certain line, because to me, line is language. It's me actually having a conversation with myself about what I'm thinking about, right? So instead of getting too like short with the line or just kind of sketching back and forth, it's this clarity of starting from beginning to end, right? With a stroke. And that stroke does so many things because first of all, it's, it's me directing, right? It's directing energy, basically force from one place to another. And um, it's also fast, right? It's faster to draw. The other ways are actually slower. So I've had people tell me like, or ask me, like, how do you draw a figure in 30 seconds? That is the main secret. The main secret is it's this line, right? There's other things that get piled on top of it, but the foundation is the line itself. Mm -hmm. And you can see here I've written, like, coming from main event and going to. It's because I'm, I'm literally having these thoughts of, like, we're drawing this force. Where did it come from? The main event's basically the apex. And then, like, where is it going to? Right. So that's that line. And that line leads to um, this relationship of two lines, which is applied forces and directional forces. You know, I'll sketch this out really quick here. Um, and those lines, the combination of the two of them, they create 
uh, rhythm. All right. So, and that, that is the secret sauce then to getting through the body fast. And this is the stuff you're going to start seeing in clothing today as well. Right. So if I have a line like this and I, you know, and I have it going somewhere, the question is, where's the catch, right? It's like, where's the catch to this? Well, it's going somewhere. It's being directed. And that's why I call this directional force, by the way. Right. So directional, you'll notice that my terms, even when we go into clothes are very rational. <laughs> I try to make yeah. this stuff as simple as possible. So I can remember it, right? Say, Hey, that's a directional force. Where does it direct? It's going somewhere. Where is it? Oh, there's another directional force here that kind of catches that power, right? It's almost like you have a ball and you're taking that ball and throwing it. And there's another place that's going to catch it. And this connection between the two is this, um, what I call applied force. So APP here applied, right? So this power is pushing into this next location. We can turn these blue, right? That's our first directional and there's our second one. And that, man, that's the secret sauce, like getting through a body and making it fluid, right? Mm -hmm. In the comic book industry, they bring this up as much as they do in animation or video games. Like how do you keep the stuff alive? It gives you a, a sense of realism and dynamism, right? To like try to get flow happening, right? Do you find animators have a, a more thorough understanding of, of these kinds of concepts? Because they tend to mm -hmm. study, even in an organized way at work, more than comic mm -hmm. artists. We're, we're just kind of at home working. Yeah, if I had to be, if I had to paint some really um, broad brush strokes, I would say that animators are probably better at like fluidity and force. Mm -hmm. And comic book artists are better at like form and anatomy, right? I would say that's like the two big camps and it'd be great to get in the middle. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and this is how you can get there. If, you know, for all yes. of you that want to be comic artists, this is the, the bridge. Yeah, this is totally the bridge. Now it's funny to that, to that question, because if you get too flowy, you know, in a drawing, it can get kind of rubbery, right. And lose its uh, tension of structure. So there's this fine balance of like how much dynamism and fluid, you know, dynamism and fluidity do I want relative to the structure? And that's this like whole, that's, that's the whole balance, right? It's like figuring that out. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later when we get to shape shapes, where we can finally start merging these two ideas together. So anyway, I'm, I'm sharing this with you guys because this will, I'm giving you this little background here because this starts to work and close and I needed to, give you a little bit of foundation of how I'm drawing, how I'm thinking. I'm thinking about directions and actions. I'm thinking about how things connect to one another. So when I went to go, you know, write the clothing book, I had to think about this stuff. I was like, okay, I'm going into this new space. I'm doing clothes. Like, how does that work? And I was like, where do I start? Right. Where do I start this book? And I realized just like I do with the body, it really starts with gravity. Right. And not to get like too grandiose, but, you know, pretty much gravity is really the designer to almost everything. Everything you can think of, it's pretty much has been either man-made and has been thought to deal with gravity or is made by nature and deals with gravity, right? Trees have to deal with gravity. Grass deals with gravity. Our clothes deal with gravity. You know, my chair is designed around the ergonomics of me relative to gravity, right? So we have this constant force. It's a force, right? It's an invisible force yet it's showing us um it's uh the symptoms of it right which is everything's stuck to the ground everything wants to go vertically down so that's where i started my journey on figuring out how to draw clothes i'm like i've got to, i have to take gravity into mind the force of gravity this is how things are going to work and this is what i do with everything my um the way i teach is hierarchically so i always try to say i'm going to talk about this subject how far out can i push myself Right, how far out, how big of an idea can I get to? And then I try to slowly walk my way down to the detail, basically, right? So here I am, I can't get much bigger than this. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's, it's great. all encompassing. Yes, exactly, mm -mm. exactly. So when it comes to figure drawing, it's great to think about gravity, right? This is one of Matunje's, in fact. So here's gravity, right? Like thinking about this weight, this guy's carrying this bag. How does it affect the body? Remember orange in my books is applied force. I think all that weight, you got this blue directional and how it's moving through the body and all these green lines in the book that represent this pull of gravity. So what does that look like? What is, how does that feel? You know, and this really grounds your figures, you know, and then, as David was saying earlier, animators think about this all the time because in animation, if you lose track of physics while something's moving, it's really obvious 
in comics, you can get away with it a little bit more. You can throw the drop shadow under something, right? And it's like, feels grounded, <laughs> right? In fact, um, we were talking about Mignola before, and I remember mm -hmm. I had I used to have a school in California, and, and Mike came over as my first guest speaker, ironically. And uh, and I remember him saying that. He's like, if I want to ground something or give something height off the ground, just throw a drop shadow in there, right? Put the foot on the ground with a drop, and they're on the ground, or distance the drop from the foot and they're running off the ground <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah yeah so fast <laughs> I mean, he's so heavily influenced by frank rosetta who for me when i think of gravity in an artist it's always frank rosetta his characters are just so grounded yeah super grounded super voluminous you know mm -hmm. yeah I, i've been using frosetta since i started teaching which was 1995 you know like and he's an amazing inker just a great drawer mm -hmm. great painter i mean he was like well you know the only thing i wish frank had done that i guess he never really did or at least i've never seen a sculpt right and then we would have the and do maybe architecture and he would have been the modern michelangelo <laughs> right? i have no doubt he could have done it no uh, yeah i don't that's that's true <laughs> i don't doubt that either that is very true so i just want you to be aware of gravity again it sounds like common sense but Man, I could tell you how often when I'm in mentoring, the piece I can see in somebody's drawing they're forgetting is like weight, right? It's weight of the body. So that starts leading to clothes finally. So I started thinking about gravity as design. I'm like, well, how do our clothes work? The majority of what we wear is hanging off of our shoulders and strapped around our waist, right? David and I both right now, we have <laughs> shirts on with a t-shirt on, right and my shirt's hanging off of my shoulders it's got like a v opening right but my head's coming out of this hole in the top it's sitting on my shoulders and i have pants on with a belt right and that's what holds my pants up right and you think about it like oh that's so funny right because think about like suspenders right and the name suspenders right they're suspending the pants in space on your body right over your shoulders so again i love the common sense of that right that's what helps me teach it's what like david was saying earlier it's what helps me create systems because i try to start off with the common senseness of this right like how far back can i go so here it is right shoulders and waistline right now so that finally leads us to what i started doing in creating systems as i said okay in the book i'm going to bring in green green will represent gravity i, I also love the alliteration of that <laughs> and then orange has always been applied force for the last 20 years so i can't change that right it's like orange is applied force <laughs> Yeah, I can't change that now. It's a brand. Green, exactly. It's a brand, <laughs> right? The whole darn library is blue and orange. So um, so that brought me to this. And that I, what I, I started doing in the book is I said, you know what? I think a good first step is for all of you, you know, to look at models dressed right? and just say, can I figure out where these gravity and anchor and applied force anchor points are? And then uh, you can see the black lines here they would basically be um, directional force lines, right? They're just connecting from place to place. And I would recommend overdo it, right? Overdo it. Because by overdoing it, you really start to see the systems, right? It's like, oh, I see. So here's a gravity anchor point, it's just hanging off her shoulder. And you can see how it's like pulling down the sleeve, right? And it's pulling from here down the back to this other gravity anchor point. And I call that a gravity anchor point because she just has it tied up there. Mm -hmm. And everything's flowing down. I consider this an, um, an applied force because her leg is pushing back instead of her standing straight. So it's an action the body took to make the folds go that way, right? So that's why I've, I've colored them the way I have. Now, I have to say I've done this many, many times. And sure, and we'll see later today. Sometimes it's like a point I think can actually be two colors because it might react to something prior to it or after it. So, And we'll get further into that later. But I think this is a good starter. You know, it's like, hey, let's just take a look at clothes. You could do this in comics, right? Look at comic book artists. You know, David was saying how he's looked at other artists too to learn. You can just go grab stuff from the internet, grab some comic book artists, grab those caped superheroes, right? And go, where are the, you know, where's the gravity anchor points? Where are the applied force anchor points, right? Here's another one. So here I made them all orange. And I did that because I figured it does really look like she's pushing up on her shoulder right so pushing up pushing out because of the elbow pushing out because of the back of her pelvis and i'm trying to find those relationships there it's like we're starting to create freeways right there's these anchor points and between them is tension right and there so is so much tension. tension sorry there's so much yeah. tension that i could almost imagine that it would look 
pretty similar even in zero gravity just because it's it's all pulled from tension points in her body yes yes that's exactly right it's like it's the body so there's this balance of depending on the kind of fit of clothing um meaning tight fit clothing medium fit or loose fit clothing which is actually in the book it's this whole section of it um the tighter the clothing fit the more the body is probably doing the work and the looser the clothing fit like a toga for instance the more gravity is probably doing the work right so i'm like oh my god there's another system right it's like these are things i didn't know until i like you said until i dig in and i'm like oh and there is literally a graph in the book that goes look here's an x graph if you consider like gravity versus applied force across tight to medium to loose fit clothing it crosses itself right does that make sense it does yeah absolutely yeah so yeah so now all of a sudden there's like this clear system you have in play right it's like okay in medium fit i probably have a little bit of both on the loose stuff we got a lot of gravity going on here a lot of hanging you know capes and stuff like that a lot of hanging right tighter fit clothing like superheroes that have more of the spandex stuff right it's it's all controlled by the body nothing's hanging right it's like stuck mm -hmm. to their body so and that also leads to certain fold types that would happen because of that and then boom voila all of a sudden you understand the systems of the fits the anchor points the clothing types you know and so on right the fit types um and so that's what i'm going to keep explaining here right so so here's this first exercise first assignment i would highly recommend do this do it in real photography look at comics and assess like who's doing what and why is it working right and try to discover these right try to find this it's just such a great opportunity to learn before you really go in and like try to draw it right so that leads me to some drawings from the book um you can see here i said the shoulder is green um we're pulling to the applied force anchor point of the elbow and then the same thing with the wrist right and you can see this is all pulling and this is collapsing Right. You can see we've got folds up here that are like piling up on one another because all the stretch is along the back of the arm. And then same thing, back of the arm to the wrist. And you can see all the folding up because of that. Right. So at least now, you know, you start seeing, ah, I get I get how this is working. If I get these two points, I get that tension in between them. And I know what's the, where the body's affecting, where gravity is affecting it. You're starting to get systems that would allow you to draw from imagination, you know, mm -hmm. versus uh, reference. Right. Any thoughts yeah, and that's always yeah. that's always the big challenge is it's one thing to look at a photo or, or something that's already there and, and draw the folds and it's another thing to draw your own figure and then just put folds on it and make it convincing and that's you know it took me years and years uh and eventually i got enough of a library of copying other people doing it you know that i kind of got a, a jerry rig system you know but it took a long, yeah. long time yeah yeah i think you know, when I see in mentorship, we go through teaching everyone the skills of how to draw. And they that whole first long period is off of reference, off of models. And then I've kind of designed something called bridges. Uh, and these bridge exercises are, okay, how do we start to leave reference? And that that is a tough bridge, you know? I kind of picture Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, <laughs> you know, and that like little rope bridge <laughs> holding the rocks. I'm like, there is the precarious bridge that you need to cross, right? To get from reference to drawing from imagination. But man, if you can get to that other side, that's like this whole other world again, which, you know, most comic book, comic book artists do, right? They're drawing out of their head. And mm -hmm. again, that's why I bow to the skill set. I know how tough that is. And not every artist does. Some artists use reference, of course. So but, um, this might be skipping ahead just a little bit, but yeah. we have a question from Abbott and he says, uh, if there are two straight edges stretching fabric, why does the fabric bunch up into ridges instead of just being flat and tight? What's the science behind this? Uh, let me see. I'm not sure if I understand the question, but let's see. Two Where is that? Oh, yeah, I see it. If there are two straight edges stretching fabric, if there's two straight edges, why does the fabric bunch up into ridges instead of being flat and tight? If there's two, yeah, I'm not sure I really understand the question. Yeah. Of it, okay. Right? Because it's it seems like like there's two different things going on in the question well you know, maybe you can rephrase if you just you know yeah yeah that'd be great yeah i'd love to try mm -hmm. to solve it for you but i'm just thinking if it was two straight edges then we wouldn't have bunching up so i guess that's what think, yeah to me it would right. it seem like it would be flat at that point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so to end on the force portion of today <laughs> right we had that drawing i brought in a couple of other ones just for you guys to see 
you know, here's this guy who's lunging forward with his arm. And you can see um, in the drawings over here how I've said the shoulders in this case, I said, are actually applied, which is interesting, right? And I said they're applied because he's lunging forward with his shoulders. So I'm thinking in terms of action, right? He's applying with that, going in that direction. Remember, I always, I'm always thinking in directions, and that goes all the way down to the line, and the line builds up and creates the body. So he's lunging forward, and therefore we have all these folds happening you know, off of that. Nothing happening much down here. Is an, it's an anchor at the armpit that's pulling up to the arm, right? So I use that as an applied force. You know, here's the anchor at the seam, basically, and it's getting pulled up to the bicep because of the arm being raised, right? I, I will say we can't actually see where you're pointing on the screen. It's not showing. Oh, you can't see my cursor. No. Is that right? Okay. Well, I'll try to zoom in on the areas I'm, I'm talking okay. about then. So, so you can see here, you know, the, uh, uh, the orange. Says, sorry. It says, uh, sorry, I just got here. What does the green represent? The green represents gravity. Yes, gravity. Exactly. So there's one. And then last but not least, um, this, is, uh, this is me as a model. <laughs> so when you have your own business, you got to do it all. <laughs> right. <laughs> So Mertunje drew these and we were trying to find stuff like this online. We just couldn't find it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to videotape myself with a maybe pea coat, right? And I wanted like a great huge turn and a flip of the jacket from an animator standpoint to recognize like, wow, look at how the folds relate to action, right? So you can see the throwing of the coat through the curve, right? Here, I'll zoom in again. You can see the, the in the center drawing that huge blue arrow talking about the direction of force of the coat and then how that gets really dramatized as it gets to the end of its rotation with this um, compression of all those folds against that rotation, right? Mm -hmm. So pretty dramatic, you know, really fun. And you could see I drew this blue arrow literally around my shoulder so you could see it. You could see the orange there because uh, that's the area that in my shoulder here, that's the area that's really driving the turn basically. Mm -hmm. So all the energy of the body is pushing into that shoulder to help the rotation occur. And in, in animation, this is called overlapping action, by the way. So the body does a job and anything loose follows, right? So my shoulder is pushed down already at that point and the jacket's not done yet. It's like, okay, I got to follow the leader. It's going to come in right behind it. In fact, that's a great trick in comics to do that, right? Because you might have a character landing. Let's say they jumped in their landing but the cloak is still up in the air, right? So they're already on the ground, but the cloak's up behind them, like coming down, right? So you're- you get, Because it's only a still image, you get such a suggestion of, of implied movement, which absolutely, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in comics, that's that's awesome, you know, when people do that. It reminds me of, uh, you know, Miller did Elector Assassin, and uh, there's this great drawing of like Daredevil uh, when he's Matt Murdock, and he's jumping on this uh, phone line, like this electrical line, and there's snow on it, and the snow is still up in the air where the wire was, but his feet have pushed it down about four or five feet below it, yeah. right? And I'm like, oh, that's so smart, right? That's such a clever little idea there to show us that that frozen moment, that millisecond in time where that would have happened, you know? Those kinds yeah, of things are cool. Yeah, it's giving that extra uh, thing that doesn't just make it a static, static image. So very quickly, um, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I have well, I don't have an announcement because I'm terrible with this stuff. But we have Jason uh, here from Essential Sequential. Uh, I'm gonna. Um, so we have a new cover for the Kickstarter <laughs> book, and I wanted to talk about that quickly. Uh, so thank you, Mike, for giving us just a minute to. to yeah, no commercial break. Come on yeah, in. Yeah. <laughs> How's it going? Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> uh. I don't like looking at my face. Ooh, can we, can we, can we... All right, hang on. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> there you go. I'd rather look at your art than, uh, than my face. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so everyone, uh, we just added a few new goodies, a uh, new Spider-Man dust jacket to David's uh, Marvel Art of Book, since everyone was asking. So you can go and um, support the Kickstarter over there. And we added a new canvas print for all you guys. So an ultimatum one, is that right? Am the I... ultimatum, uh, yeah. the five covers. So it's a big, huge canvas. Uh, it's got the X-Men and Avengers and all the villains. And it's, it's a huge, huge piece. So 
and the uh, Spider-Man one, a whole, an all new cover with a nice dust jacket. We sold out of those almost right away. Uh, I think actually, and it was really you guys that did it. And thank you for that because we were, we were doing the live stream where we launched the book and those sold out I think within a half an hour of the live stream. So we have wow. uh, a second cover, which I'm very excited about. And the um, Kickstarter ends really, it's, it's only a few days, right? I think we're yeah, we got six, six, days away? six days left. Yeah. So, uh, we try, we'll try not to bother too many, you know, uh, you guys for too much longer, uh, after that. <laughs> yeah, that'll be the end of it. But I really wanted to get this in there to mention to you guys that we do have another cover. So please go over there and check it out. It's at the, uh, Marvel art of David Finch, uh, Kickstarter. I think we have a link. If we don't, you just type that into Google and it, it comes up. That's how I found it earlier on, but yeah, there you go. So thank you so there, much. Yes, yeah, there is a link. I think you guys, um, just edit it, but I'll add it just in case. And uh, yeah, I'll let you get back to uh, right. your drawing. Yeah, I didn't want to take up too much time, but I also didn't want to miss that too. So thank you so yeah. much. Well, yeah, we'll let fine. you get back to, you know. I'm going to play zombies. I'll see you All right, later. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> see you. Yeah. Nice Thanks meeting you. <laughs> thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, congratulations. I'm glad that, uh, that it's doing so well. Yeah, and thank canvas you. posters, that's cool. How big are those? Do you know? Is that bigger than 18 by 24? Oh, yeah. I'm going to do it this way. Just about like that big. Where's my other hand? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's pretty big. Yeah, it, because it's very long. It's five covers mm -hmm. put together. So, or four, mm -hmm. four or five. So it's that, it's very, you know. How many figures do you think are in the that one poster? Oh, it's got to be at least 30, maybe 40. I did an wow. X-Men one with hundreds. This one's like wow. kind of the, the major character, so they're a little more, you know, but still, it's thing took me forever to do. It took so long. That I, I was my next question is how long yeah. is forever? Is that like yeah. a six month or a two year project? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I was on deadline. So I, I want to say it took me probably about six days or so, which oh, you know, on a deadline, that's, that's a good chunk of time. Yeah, that's quick. That's way faster than I anticipated you to say. That's for sure. Not with that many people, you know. Helps have an inker. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that, that's good. I'll have to remember that. <laughs> it helps to have an inker. So uh, to pick up where we left off, I wanted, uh, what I'm bringing in here is a sense of movement, right? So it's not just studying still photos, but it's great to look at motion. It's great to go to YouTube and look at videos of people moving around with clothes. You know, nowadays I would recommend like parkour is awesome to look at, right? You got guys jumping around and loose clothes, right? Absolutely. I, you know, I have to admit, I've not looked at it for clothes, but just the, the figures themselves, I've got all kinds of pictures saved and I never even really thought about, you know, studying mm -hmm. how the clothes are moving. Yeah. Yeah. And those, man, those guys are crazy and amazing. Right. But for clothes, that would be great. And they don't usually wear tight stuff, ironically, you know, so you could probably get like great pants and shirts and stuff out of that along with how athletic those guys are, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so last but not least, that brings us to some photographs here. I thought I would do it right here and just kind of analyze together, like what's going on. So this is me again modeling because we couldn't find good, you know, photographs of like people just pulling on their shirt. I wanted to get the tension, all right? Mm -hmm. So here I am. <laughs> this is Priya. She's one of our models that worked for us on the clothing book. Uh, so let's take a look here. So if I start thinking about, um, you know, like what's going on here, we'll start with me. Um, and start thinking about color. It's like, well, this is pretty much a gravity anchor point. Nothing's really going on here, all right, you see? Um, and if I look at now, you know, the folds, of course, the most dynamic thing to go after here is like this, right? And mm -hmm. there's, some, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on here, right? There's some stuff going on here. But how do I like differentiate all this? So from a force standpoint, forget about anchors for a quick second. I, I definitely want this all to get this pulling idea. And I do want this like hook that's happening here. You can almost see how long the idea goes, right? It's like, wow, that almost goes from my armpit here around my neck out to my arm. So that's like one idea. This is like the top half. And then there's the bottom half, right? And that pulls to this button. So this poor button is under a lot of stress, right? And then you can see that's pulling all the way to my pelvis. So that's cool, right? This is what I love about teaching and analyzing stuff. It's like, wow, look at that. Look at this full system from my armpit to the hand to my hip, right? And then this is kind of relaxing all on its own outside of that whole like U shape that's happening with the forces of the clothing, right? Pretty cool, mm -hmm. right? 
you find this cool, David. <laughs> yeah, it's and you can you can really see it. I, I just seeing some of the previous slides that you showed, showing just uh, some of the simple lines. Really, just it, it takes the entire piece of clothing with all these tiny little folds and all this detail, and it just simplifies it into a couple little uh, lines. And I feel like even before you put the larger, you know, kind of flow lines on on this yeah. one. I felt like I could kind of see it a little bit more clearly than I think I would have. So mm -hmm. it's great so great. far. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And you know, it's the same thing with the figure. What I love is again, it's hierarchy. It's like, what's the big system here? And there's my body of course, inside of all this, but it's like, how did the clothes work? You know? So now we have this understanding of, you know, it's pushing against my neck. It's hooked up around my armpit. It's coming around to the hand, the hands fighting the button, which is going all the way down to my hip. We have this system in place, right? So now to go back to the anchor points, wow, this is definitely an applied force anchor point, right? It's like mm -hmm. my hand's action pulled this out that way, right? And then to go to white, well, let's use blue. Let's stick with the colors, right? So this is all pulling this way. As I said before, we have this, we have this, we have all of this pulling, right? Um, now we get to this button. So the button's kind of interesting. This is what I was saying earlier today on uh, some of these are a little challenging. Like, what is the button? Is it a gravity anchor point, an applied force anchor point? I kind of look at the button, I think, is it's kind of a gravity anchor point for this guy because it's kind of grounded. It's not like it's an action. It's dealing with this because of the pull of my hand, right? So it's not doing it on its own. The hand is still like the number one, you know, the number one driver. So I would, let's put a one in there, right? Like that's the number one driver but we still have to get all the way down here right so it feels like to me this is actually an orange for this anchor point you see so i think this has almost two jobs right it's like it's a gravity for my hand because i have to pull against it and i'm my hand is doing the work but yet the button for the point down to my hip is relating to my hip and it is pulling because of number one right so this would be like applied force anchor point number two right this uh smaller guy would be right here right uh so does that make sense it does yes yeah i can't help but see uh, under his arm it uh, there's it just seems to be a lot of force kind of coming through there it's a real pull point and yeah right I, here yeah and I, I would say that would be a, a green point right yes yeah i would agree yeah like over here is another green one so look at the colors. And again, I love the systems of these. It's This starts making sense to me. And that's what I strive for. It has to make sense to me in order for me to be able to teach it to you guys. So hopefully then it makes sense to you, right? It's like, wow, I'm really starting to see the system of everything going on here. We've got all this. We've got this pulling up this way. It's pulling behind my neck over here. Let's make this arrow look more clear like that. All right, it's all pulling here. It comes down, it's pulling me here. And now we got these guys, you know, like getting pulled up this way, right? So this whole side, look at this whole side, actually, right? This whole side is like the green side against the orange side, right? Yeah. All right. To be super abstract, high but level, it, right? That's abstract it. maybe, but it just, it, it simplifies it into such a, a understandable concept. And, you know, that's such a difficult thing to do with any kind of art I've found. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. great. Thank you. Yeah, that's that was really fun. By the way, I didn't, this is the first time I'm really looking at this picture. So I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Look, we got a wall of green. And this basically, in the world of my force figure drawing, what we just did was we said, you know, there's a directional force that goes like this. It's because there's a massive applied force here. And it's all really been anchored on this side. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what we're dealing with, right? So there's the, the simplicity. And then after that, man, you can go to detail heaven with it, right? You can get everything layered in there, light and shadow form, but at least there's a power in there, an abstract power that's making this dynamic, you know, and yes, functional and, and real. And coming up, we're not going to leave you guys hanging. We'll be talking about a lot of that detail, talking about different types mm -hmm. of folds. And mm -hmm. I don't want to jump ahead. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So in Priya, not too different from the last one. Now that I look at it, I grabbed these because I just thought, oh, these have some things I want to talk about. But now that I look at it, oh, what do we got here? Like, you know, we have all this pulling across her body, right? Like this. So, and that's why I grabbed this particular image, mostly because of this pull across the, the shirt, right? Mm -hmm. It's not so much, 
Here, I don't know if I would say it's so much about her shoulder. This feels like it's not doing much of anything. Her hand is, and it's got its own folds like over here, but the shoulder's kind of stiff. I would say it's because of her pushing out now in the hip. Now for me, that's not what the case was, right? There, I was part of the wall, right? The hip was part of the wall. Here, I think it's her pushing out with her hip that's causing the stretch from the shoulder to the pelvis, right? So mm -hmm. similar angle and stuff in the folds, but different activity, right? Things are working a little differently there, right? You can see here, if I zoom in, um, let's see here. You know, she's raising her arm, right? So we have, um, I would say these are applied force. And you can see with the blue that this is all kind of coming from like her armpit and like sweeping up like this, right? Because she raised this up basically, right? This, these would not look like this if her arm were down. So that's mm -hmm. a good way of keeping differentiating like what's an applied force anchor point? Well. Would it look like this if everything were straight? No. So this has been changed because she did this, right? Uh, last but not least, I grabbed this photo because um, because of this leg, right? Here, I would say, um, remember we talked earlier about like usually the shoulders are green and the pants line or even a skirt, a belt line are typically green zones. They're anchoring stuff down. And then we have here this pull, right? So this is all doing this pulling, 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 right? It's all like this, all pulling. Why is it pulling? It's pulling because of this, right? So there's our applied force anchor point, right? It's like all these clothes are pulling from the back of her pelvis across her leg with these really wide loose pants and then pushing into that knee, right? Oh, you can see down here too, which is interesting. And this, um, you know, this is up for question, right? Like. Yeah, her foot's there. Her knee is probably pulling this forward and we can't see it. It's probably like right here somewhere. And it's causing like folds from even all the way up from her hip that are doing this. I'm feeling right, smart. Because... Just thinking that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. It's easy for you to say that out, but I was just thinking that. Yeah, 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 cool. <clears throat> yeah, so all this is hanging. This is just hanging, hanging, hanging. But we have this nice diagonal that's kind of hooking around her leg over here. And you can see because the pants are so wide. I mean, this is all just like straight, like pull down. It's all like, especially here at the edge, it made its way all the way down because it's structure of the pants, right? It can't go any further left, right? So if these, if this pants were a different material, softer, not as stiff as what these look like, I think we would have seen this too, right? We would have seen a little bit of this happen, mm -hmm. but they're so stiff, right? She's pushing across against with her foot over here like this, that we're not seeing it. You know, there just looks like a giant board right down along the bottom. So that's the force segment, right? I just want you to be aware. We're talking about line. We're trying to abstract forces. I think it's awesome for you to look at comic book artists. I think it's great to look at photo reference, look at models, try to find photos that have some dynamic stuff going on in them with the clothing, with the poses. See if you can recognize anchor points of gravity and applied and use those blue lines to connect, right? To, to feel that tension. Those are your directional forces and overdo it, overdo the line so you can, amplify the clarity of what's happening right yes yeah, so i like the idea of um to your point of overdoing it a lot of times when i'm trying this i'm underdoing it <laughs> and then i'm not you know I, I i can't render anything because i haven't put enough in, information down so using these yeah. uh, an, an, anchor points and yeah i think so it's going to be a game changer for sure yeah not, bible not, nerd sorry i just put it says uh, stripes make it uh, difficult to see the folds Okay, the stripes on the pants, you mean? I thought you meant the, the drawing on top of it. I was going to say they're, you know, clarifying and showing where all the movement is, but that's not what you meant. Sorry, go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not worried about the tech, you know, the uh, design of the fabric. What we want is just to abstract how it works. If I could have, I would have had her wearing an outfit that was all just pink, right? And had no no textile design on it because we just want to see the folding of it. Once we get that, then you put the skin on it, meaning, you know, the textile of the fabric, and then that would have to go over the bumps and ridges of all the forms, right, to get all that, that working. Uh, yeah. So uh, I was going to say something really quick to Eric. Oh, yeah, you know, when I'm when I'm teaching drawing, um, I do here, I'll do it. It's just it'll only take me a second if you guys don't mind. It's this little like visual metaphor I talk about with learning. And it kind of looks like this. It's like, here's a pier. And there's a kid standing here and another kid standing here and there's a pier and here's like the edge of the water and here's the pier and the ripples of water right 
and these kids are on the pier and they both want to learn how to um how to jump off this pier and do a flip and go into the water right and kid a like runs in jumps and messes up and comes out and gets back here and while he does that kid b has maybe gotten to here right so you can see right away what's happening right it's like well kid a does it again kid b gets to like here he does it again kid b gets to here he does it again kid c you know kid b gets to there and this keeps going on right so by the time b gets to the end of the pier a finally does a flip and he does it successfully because he's overdone it right fail right. early fail fast right like that is the i think that's one of the big secrets to learning is don't get precious don't get scared it's easy to get like nervous about messing up you just got to fail early fail fast make a lot right. of mistakes you know yeah. and then yeah. man you learn like a rocket ship advice. absolutely yeah so very quickly this, uh yeah. you can get force fabric uh russ hicks and thank you so much russ has uh, a link up in the top of the, the description or the chat, sorry, um, at drawingforce.com uh, and you get 20% off. You can also get a uh, standard monthly membership with a brush pack and there's a bunch of stuff and I've totally forgotten, I'm so sorry, Mike, but there's a bunch of, the, there is a an elite membership, which is a lifetime membership. There's also, um, okay. You yeah, know. and that comes, that comes for free, that $800 value of the elite membership, which is lifetime access to the website, comes for free if you purchase the 36 session package, which is only on this link. If you go to the website right now and just buy 36, mm -hmm. that's not attached to it. Um, it's only, I'm only giving that to you guys through David here, right? Yeah. If you go to the site, you actually won't see it. Great, definitely great, great value. I would jump on that for anyone. Yes, and, and it's uh, individualized uh, teaching, which is so difficult to get. Um, something I, I wish I could do, and I, I just, I, I can't. But uh, you can get it from Mike, um, and it, it is the way, the easiest way to learn because you do the work, you make the mistakes, and then you can show it, find out what those mistakes are quickly, and then just keep iterating from there instead of grinding your wheels and making the same mistakes over and over again. So I highly recommend that you guys go and check it out. And uh, thank you, uh, give it a thanks, try. David. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you very much. You know, I I think about you guys today. Um, Man, I wish I had this available to me when I was <laughs> like, you know, student's age, because I'm sure, you know, David, you're around the same age as I am. And, uh, you know, I'd have to go to the library or if a teacher told us about an artist, I couldn't go online. You had to like, I searched New York. I went to school in New York City. I would search all the bookstores in New York to see if I could find that artist book. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm from uh, a small town in Canada. So. You know, I, you get what you get there. There was no internet to go search for, for things. I got so yeah. lucky. I found uh, George Bridgman's Guide to Life Drawing in the local library uh, when yeah. I went starting to draw. And it just, it was the book that was there. And that's that's what started me. It's still my favorite. Yeah, it's a good book. It's a very good book. I, I, have, I have numerous copies of the Bridgman book, actually. <laughs> yeah. I remember I got the Bridgman book, actually, because there was this um, legend that uh, Frazetta uh he wanted to get into comics and the first like publisher was like you don't know your anatomy well enough right and he told him to go learn anatomy so Frazetta went home and i think he drew for like two or three days like night and day night and day and just burned through the bridgeman book and came back and the guy was like okay you have a job <laughs> like i was like if that can happen to him i'm doing this like i'm gonna you know i'm gonna yeah. scour this book like crazy right yeah absolutely <laughs> so this leads us to the second section of um ideas of dealing with clothes Again, pretty common sense, but I want to bring it up here just as an awareness piece is form um, comes from clothing, right? When you're drawing clothes, I mean, it comes from the body, right? But the clothing is a great opportunity to present the form of the body, the different directions that it's moving in, right? So you can see these ellipses on the legs. Uh, you know, you can see the, the ellipse on the torso and around the arms. This is us just taking this figure drawing and doing it, right? But that starts leading to clothes, you know, it's like, Look at the hole in the arm. That gives me the form of the side of the body. This ellipse is created through the construction of the body. Look at the curve at the bottom of the skirt. Look at the curve at the top of the shoe. Those curves are really, really, really powerful because those ellipses very clearly give us uh, directions in space. You know, ironically, you know, we all know perspective is drawing these straight lines, but what's interesting is a straight line all on its own 
it doesn't give me any sense of form and it doesn't have it. It needs a partner, right? As soon as you have two of these, your brain goes, oh, there's a vanishing point there. Things are pinching, right? But a curved line, besides it being very forceful, a curved line starts to insinuate, mm, maybe I'm looking at a tube, right? Like maybe this is an ellipse like this, right? So all on its own, it's already fooling us into thinking there's something more going on, right? It's so suggesting another dimension, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a very that's a beautiful way. I couldn't say it any better. <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah, it is suggesting another dimension, right? And it really is, right? It really, really is. I mean, as David knows, you know, this is all a giant illusion. It's the grand illusion, right? We're working on two-dimensional surfaces, and mm -hmm. yet our brains think this stuff is dimensional. There's no dimension here. It's flat. It's a flat screen, right? And when it's done as well as this, it's really easy to just not even recognize it, especially as a layman. You haven't drawn much. You mm -hmm. don't see that 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 boot, the top of it, is really mm -hmm. pushing the leg out, and also the top of the leg. Uh, just behind the knee, that curve mm -hmm. there is pushing the lower leg in front of the the upper leg. Like you, mm -hmm. everything is really directional. The the skirt, like you said, mm -hmm. and that's yeah, yeah, very intentional yes. and very simple. But if you don't know, you don't realize that that's what's creating that illusion. And it's so easy to break it when you don't really understand it. Yes. No. Great calls. Yeah. The the back of the knee to the boot, like understanding those tubes of construction and how do you finally show those in very simple terms, right? To to just allow the drawing to shine versus all that, those years of work, <laughs> right? That it took to make it that simple looking, Yeah. right? Yeah, so, and, and by the way, just on the side note, this is a two minute drawing, right? So you can see how much you can get done in two minutes, right? When you know all those shortcuts, it's like, you know, you, if you see any drawings of mine, there's a number, that number is usually a time limit. It's like how long it take me to draw it, right? So last but not least, um, there's form, the, uh, you know, so think about that from head to toe, you could have a hat on your head that gives the roundness of the head, right? You could have the hole in the neck. You could have shirt sleeves. You could have three quarter sleeve shirts. You have the sleeve at your wrist. As you go down the body, you have the waistline for the pants in the bottom of the shirt. You can have shorts on. You can go down to the bottom of the pants to the cuff, right? These are all moments of like structure, 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 all the way from head to toe. And on top of that, the reason I bring this drawing in is you also have seams, right? You also have seams. So this is a seam, right, for the center of the kid's back, right? This is a seam for the, cent for the side, the center of the side of the guy's shirt, right? Those are really powerful, really, really powerful ways of creating form with clothing, right? Is to recognize how it's put together. Most, you know, most clothes, like if you take a shirt, for instance, you know, it's got this hole in the neck and it's got a line usually down each side because it's flat. It's a flat piece of fabric, right? It's like this, right? And then another flat piece of fabric is put behind it, right? On the other side, like this. And those two things get sewn together. Those two pieces of fabric get sewn together on this seam, right? And then they add another one to this hole that you've now made between those two pieces of fabric and put on this extra piece of fabric, right? So Kind of be aware of the overarching simplicity of how clothes are made. The same with your pants. If you look at your pants, you'll have a seam down each of the outsides of your legs and the insides because it start off as flat pieces of clothes, fabric, right, that are just s stitched together, right? Then you have grommets and stuff like that, like on pockets and all, right? But the simplicity of it is understand these divisions, right? At Disney Animation, right, so my, my career really started at Disney Feature. Um, you learned in 2D animation that the clothing, and even when they're not clothed, like, so I was on Lion King, right? So even on the animals, uh, the way the designs of the animal are designed with their uh, textures, um, you know, spotting, stripes, all that kind of stuff, or on clothes for characters, uh, you use the clothing to help the construction, right? Because you were drawing 2D. So you want things to be as simple as possible, right? L the less detail, the better. So how efficiently can you do it? And this is what we did, right? It's like being aware of the costume design to help represent. You'll see in Disney stuff, the 2D stuff from, let's say, you know, the 90s and prior, it's very rare that an outfit has like asymmetry in it. It's typically symmetrical. Things are down the middle or down the middle of the side because it's easier to construct. You know, you're not going to put things usually like 
on the chest or on a three quarter spot. It's just harder to track, right? When you're animating it. So anyway, my note to form, as we close up on form here, I wanna leave you with the idea here of be aware of name construction, right? So all these holes basically on how clothes are built and you've got seams. Now in comics, um, you have also stuff like the insignia of the character, right? So you got Superman or Batman, for instance, right? It's like Spider-Man smack in the middle, <laughs> right? I remember when, I don't know if the X-Men still do this, but I remember the insignia was on the left chest for a while, right? That's harder to actually get right and all the time get it in the right place. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you got to think about the box of the pec, the pectoralis, and like kind of X that out and figure out where the middle is for the patch, right? I think of Robin with his little R. Really yes. Nice. Yeah, and that's it, a more historical one. Mm -hmm. It reminds me a little, well, it's similar enough. Uh, so many characters in comics now have diagonal lines through the costumes. So on the leg, you'll have the leg coming down and you'll have a diagonal line crossing through one color here, one color there. And that's mm -hmm. fine. But when I start bending the leg, that diagonal line can drive me crazy because <laughs> fighting the the round of the leg it's I, that's one design choice that artists make some artists make it look really good i struggle with that so much every time yeah yeah you got to wrap it around that tube right and it becomes mm -hmm. more way more challenging that is for sure and even you know, it's, 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 challenging yeah, and also even done correctly it can still kind of break the illusion a little bit at times it's frustrating yeah yeah <clears> it can flatten it yeah yeah i think just to sketch what you're talking about, I think what you're saying is like, here's the hip and here's the knee, but flatly, if the leg looks like this and you had a stripe go down like that, is that right. right? Yes. And you try to bring that over here, suddenly you're like, oh my God, I have to make this stripe like feel like it's going over the tube correctly, right? Okay, that actually really works. So there you go. It can be done. <laughs> I just can't do it. It can be done, but it's hard. It is hard. <laughs> to get that right. And it could look flat. If you don't get enough to put kind of this double S curve in there, it's yep. going to flatten out. You know, you're going to draw a tube like this, and then you're going to do this. And then suddenly it's like, oh, I flatten the tube out, right? I put like a piece of tape across it that's straight and it'll kill it, right? It's like Yeah, I was about to say the form, the form, you know, going from his up, upper arm to his elbow to his forearm, forearm is really described there by, by the fabric. Yes. And then also the um, the angular, little ang <laughs> angular line you have there to me is very helpful too because it insinuates texture. So you're mm -hmm. having the, you know, the soft and the hard lines in the fabric just really sells the idea of, uh, you know, his body being clothed. Which, uh... Yeah, that's like, and we'll get into that. That's a whole other like can of worms is, believe it or not, line can create texture. So we'll try to close out with that today. That's like the icing, icing, icing on the cake. But I think, you know, you're right, David, in that this is, uh, you know, th these are tough situations. So if you were to, you know, for some of you out there that are thinking maybe about creating your own comic, for instance, be aware of the costume design because you're going to do it over and over again. Yes. <laughs> and you want to use the design to help you create good form, right? You don't want to make that job harder. So any, it is cooler to go asymmetrical, no doubt. It's a great design choice, but um, you got to just be aware of like where you put it and why you put it and figure out your own system to how you're going to draw it, you know? I'm, you know, I'm just it, amazed at how you wrap that line around the leg and the, that <laughs> top of drawing there. Like I learned something there. I think That's I can funny. make that work now. <laughs> You're funny. Yeah, I just like push this down basically and push that up. Yeah, like, and it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So it's yeah. hysterical. Well, I'm happy to help. <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking about the chess thing, um, just to keep coming back to comics and how much of a geek I am myself here. Um, I remember in The Dark Knight, which uh, on a personal note was the comic that led me to wanting to go into comics. It was Frank Miller's Dark Knight and Jansen's inking on that. Um, there's a, I don't know if you remember this, this moment in the story, David, but, um, he, I think Batman's coming out of a helicopter, if I'm not mistaken, it's like way off in the distance and he gets shot in the chest, right? Like right on the bat. And mm -hmm. he's like, oh, do you think it's an accident that like the insignia is right there? Of course it's a target. I know they're going to go for it. <laughs> right. So he has it like fully metal plated, right? If you're going to tell somebody where to shoot, that's the part you protect. And I was like, wow, that, that is awesome writing. Like that is so damn clever. <laughs> that idea, right? I just love that. I just dork out over that stuff so much. Yeah, I, I, probably the greatest comic uh, 
ever made, you know, in, in terms of writing, so many ways in terms of art. I have artists that I, I like that are, you know, very um, slick and detailed and, and his work was a little bit more, it's incredible. The layouts are incredible. It's beautiful stuff, but it's it's also a little rougher and it took me years mm -hmm. to really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that book, again, that book changed my career path. You know, I took architecture for four years in high school and I, Dark Knight came out and I was like, the heck with the math. I'm going into comics. Like I couldn't believe how powerful it was. You know, the the writing juxtaposed to the pictures, that is what like really shocked me. It's very easy to write what you're drawing, you know, and then you're just saying the same thing twice, <laughs> you know, but he didn't do that. It's like what was written compared to the picture, like when Superman, right, gets reborn after the missile, right? And he's talking to Mother Earth and all that. And you see the S get tight. I was like, oh, my God. That's freaking genius. <laughs> like that is so powerful. It's so damn powerful, you know. It almost brings tears in my eyes. I mean, it was so shockingly good to me, you know. Well, it's life changing, so, you know. I mean, it, it changed your life. It put it you did. in a different it, direction. It it literally changed my life. No joke. It really changed my life. Yeah. So we finally get to one of my favorite subjects. After all of this, when I'm teaching force figure drawing, um, we do force, form, and shape, which is actually the same way I'm showing you how we deal with clothes. And shape is so powerful, right? It's like super fast because now you get to like the silhouette of things. So if you can draw in silhouette, you're gonna draw really, really quick. The challenge with silhouette is you have to know that form made the silhouette and that is the trick. So for those of you that like watch professionals draw, some of them will go for the silhouette first and you think like that's how you should do it. It's not how you should do it. <laughs> Right. You want to learn all the stuff that goes inside first because they're cheating. Right. They're getting to the end. They're showing you the end. Mm -hmm. Right. I know for you, yeah. David, I've seen some of your videos and you show a lot of the construction stuff like, no, this is the work like it takes for me to get to this drawing. Right. Yes. And I do cheat it quite a bit and do more of a silhouette. Um, mm -hmm. And it's in my head, which takes years. That's right. It's that's exactly true. Right. trying to do that. And that's one thing that I worry about with a, a lot of the live stream drawings that I do. I tend to do more of just a silhouette, just what I need quickly because I only have so much time and it's, it's actually a little deceptive, well, a lot deceptive to the way that you should yeah. be doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's super deceptive, you know? So when I'm teaching this, I'll give you guys a quick example of how I discuss this in mentorship, right? I'll say, well, look, you know, form is, uh, shape's really powerful, right? But if I do this, right? There's a shape, let's tone it in. I always recommend tone because that makes you see the secret. It's like, I drew it with line, you see line. I tone it in and suddenly you go, oh, I see, he drew a shape, right? There's the silhouette. And I make the students do that. When we get into shape, I'm like, everything you draw on the body as you're drawing the figure, tone it in, tone it in, tone it in. I want your brain to shift from line to shape, right? I'm seeing silhouette, but this shape, could be three different boxes. So it shows the shortcoming of the shape, right? This is not good enough, right? What I need here is either this, so it's a box where we're looking at the top, right? It's one box. It could be the opposite, right? I could do this and say, no, nope, actually I'm looking up at this box, right? That's the second one. Last one, it's a two point perspective box, right? We only have left and right, right? So my point to this is you need both. You really need both systems going on at the same, at the same time, right? Um, another really quick one, uh, spheres, right? It's like, hey, you talk about this. This is a circle, it's flat, right? Let's tone it in. It's a flat shape. And all it takes to give this form is for me to do this. And it's like, whoa, this thing just changed from being a flat circle to being a sphere or a ball, right? With one line, right? With one line. So super powerful to know that interior to make sense of the shape, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, just be aware of this. Try not to jump to shape too early without understanding why the shape is what it is. I'll give you one other quick example of how this breaks really fast. So sometimes students will go after the shape they don't realize why the shape is what it is. So these corners are corners for a reason. They're corners because of the construction, right? So I'll see students do something like this, and not on a box. I'll do this on the body. 
where they'll do something like this. Right? It's like, whoa, your interior structure doesn't match your exterior shape, right? That's what happens when you don't learn how to create the form and you go for shape first, right? Which is why, you know, David or myself, let's say, we might go for the shape, but we're thinking about this inside stuff, right? Yeah, no, it seems pretty obvious with a box, but that mm -hmm. so much holds true with anatomy. And you see, I mm -hmm. do see that quite a bit where the overall shape seems to be working, but then the, the things inside it are, are just kind of going everywhere and they're not connecting. So, yeah, know. like if I draw this shape, here's a shape. Anyone know what this shape is? <laughs> a faucet. <laughs> <laughs> it does look like one, actually. Yeah, we just have some water flow out of there here. <laughs> yeah, it's a good guess. No, this is this is a head. All right, look, uh, I go like that, and I go like that. Be my guess. Yeah. yeah, there's the head, right? So you know, and I put that line in there, but I could mess this up so easily. Right. I could say I don't recognize that that corner is the top of the forehead. Right. It can go, well, oh, this goes here and this is going here and this goes here. And suddenly the whole thing is warped out because I didn't. Let's say you don't know to draw that shape correctly relative to the form that's inside. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a whole like I'm getting down a sidetrack here. I'm just trying to prove out to you how important it is to understand form in order to create good shape. Glenn Keane is one of my big inspirations in, in my whole career. I would say there's the Dark Knight, and I would say Glenn from the Disney side of things. And he always he had these notes he used to give to his animators, and one of them said, "Know the shape of the form you are drawing, right?" Which is implying, you know, know the form, right? You have to know what the form is in order to get good shape, right? Mm -hmm. So that comes first. Don't put the cart before the horse, basically. All right, let's see. Yeah, you're gonna say something, David. Uh, yeah, you know, actually, totally unrelated, but I wanted to mention quickly that uh, Henry Jamrick is here. He wasn't Eric. He wasn't here last week, last oh. uh, last stream, and it was the first stream that he missed ever. Oh dear! So we have him back. Wow. <laughs> you know, we were just gonna give him a prize, and if it wasn't for that, seriously, yeah, yeah it was. It was last week. Sorry, Henry. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't see him back, and all of you guys, it's good to see you. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, it's great to have you know obviously a community that's that dedicated, you know, Very yeah, cool. it really is. Yeah. So to get back to shape, you know, we talked about force. The big thing that happens here is we got this line going like this, this is the force line. And then I, the straight comes into play. So the straight actually represents structure, right? This is where, you know, I remember I said earlier in our conversation, how if you draw everything with curves, it gets kind of wobbly and spaghetti. Like this is where things really start to firm up right? Because we could take that straight line and push it against the curve. And we're also not pushing importance on the line as much anymore, because hopefully at that point, you're pretty good at it. But we're focusing on the shape. So I would say force is the gray goop inside of this shape. It's like, how am I moving the goop around <laughs> from one shape to another, right? And so, we have a question from Romario who says, how do you push a shape to look flexible but retain its base? And so there you go. I think we're, we're kind of covering that right now. It's a good question. Yes, that's exactly right, right? So and it have, it, now it's flat, right? So I need things in here that have form. I could put an ellipse in here. And by the way, look, I did this ellipse and that says this is in front and this is the end, right? This is number two. All I have to do is invert that curve and we go the other way, just again to show how important this is. Look, I just do that. Now, also, this is in front, this is behind, right? So it's that combination of silhouette and form and size, silhouette and form and size. And being the force guy, what's important to me is I've got some area of it that's curved because that's how energy gets driven through it. And then what I want to do is I want to take this and I want to hook it up to another curve, right? Because that gives me rhythm. We talked about that earlier. And then I put another straight line in there like so. And now, boom, I've got two shapes flowing. So here, let me just shrink this down. And I want to show you um, that this could become uh, different things. I could say this is a leg, right? Like I can I can go in here and say, you know what? Let me get that in there. Um, I'm going to put a kneecap in here in perspective, right? Like so. I could take the anatomy here and bring this in and put that into the back. And there is a very heroic leg, right? Here's like the rear end, right? Look at that. 
Yeah, a lot of this dovetails into um, uh, we did a live stream studying Ryan Upley's work, and we also did a live stream with Eric Kennedy, and they're so dynamic, mm -hmm. and this is why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I was saying we were talking earlier. I love Kennedy Kennedy's work. I, I just love how he's a workhorse. That dude, <laughs> you know, Eric is the kid on the pier that I showed you earlier that keeps running off the pier because. <laughs> He does it 20 times before he gets to a pose that he likes, right? And that's why he's so good. Because he yeah, has he no makes it so simple, but yeah, a lot and of he work has no em... yeah, he has no embarrassment over let me just keep jumping off here and get it wrong, get it wrong, get it wrong to get to something great. You know, and that I, I love that work ethic, right? That mm -hmm. ethic of like, I'm just gonna keep jumping off the pier until I get this darn thing right, you know. So anyway, I just want to show like, isn't this to me, this is amazing, right? It's like I took two straight to curve shapes, connected them with rhythm and threw some um, ellipses in there for perspective. And I have a leg in perspective with good flow, right? The rhythm of this goes from here to here. It's very dynamic, right? And it wasn't that, I shouldn't say it wasn't that hard. Let me take that back. It looks easy because of 10 years, 20, 30 years of doing it, <laughs> right? But you can see, you can once you start putting in that time and effort, you can do this stuff pretty fast. It can be very fast, you know? So how does it deal with clothes, right? We're, like, let's get back to clothing. Well, so this is a very old drawing of mine. This is from like 1997, 98, when I was teaching in New York. Uh, this amazing model named Steve uh, Geberling. And uh, you can see there's my straight to curve shapes, right? There they are in the legs. So when the clothes are not that loose, they're relatively tight, boom, I use the body. Just give me the shape and it's a great shape and I'm done. Right? It's like I'm getting great silhouette out of it. So again, if you're drawing Spider-Man or someone like that, just get great body shape. You're finished. Right? It's the anatomy that's using that's doing it for you. But when it comes to clothing that hangs, okay, now we got a whole other thing going on, right? Because there's not only the shape of the anatomy, there's the actual shape of the folds of the fabric, right? So we want to try to get good shape out of that. Why does it matter? Well, it creates, it's appealing. You know, it gives you a sense of structure and it gives you a sense of flow. And that's how things start to move around the body, even with the clothing. Before I just showed you directional force lines on the figure when we were doing the anchor points, mm -hmm. but that's not really enough, right? We really want to get to here where we can see all these folds. So you want to shape those folds out. Now, I got to say there's a trap to this, which also goes to um, what unforceful looks like, right? What, do, what does unforceful look like? Well, unforceful in my books, and you know, it's so funny because I've been saying this now for 25 years, <laughs> but here it is again, right? It's, it's this, you don't want this shape, you don't want this shape, and you don't want this shape. Now this goes for the body and this goes for the clothing, right? You wanna try to do your best to stay away from folds that look like that, folds that look like that, and folds that look like this, right? because they're symmetrical, right? You want to try to you want to try to break the system of repetitiveness of the same thing over and over again. We don't want the folds in like Batman's cape to look like a bunch of pipes, for instance, right? We want hanging and pinch points and clothes typically do hang in these pinch points, right? So if we had like a gravity anchor point here and I'm going to draw folds, I want them like this, right? I don't want the folds to look like this. Right, this is repetitive. This is like a curtain, right? Now, how can I make that better? Believe it or not, I can at least make that better. And the way to make that better would be to say, let's say I, I do have to draw a curtain, right? The way to push this to at least be improved is change the distance, right? Here's a big, let me get rid of that line there. Here's a big space, so here's a big space. Here's a smaller one. Maybe I put a really thin one next to it. Maybe I go really big. I go back to like a medium, I go to a smaller, I go really big, I go to a couple of really smalls. It's this variation, right? So this is variation, um, or con this is a whole rule in art called contrast and affinity. So the affinity here is everything is similarly hanging, but the contrast is in the spacing in between, right? So that makes it more interesting. But it's not very forceful. It's gravity, it's pulling straight down, right? It's not very fluid, right? So if I want hanging and I want flow, I want to try to go to that good shape, which is the one I started with. That's uh, this guy, right? I'm trying to find this guy, right? I'm trying to find that guy as much as I can. So that leads me to this, right? Here's that shape, right? If I can, I want to try to get this. 
I've called this many things over 25 years. It's the lemon slice, the half pizza, <laughs> right? Like the letter D, right? Abstractly, it's like the letter D. Now it can bend a little bit, by the way, you can do this uh, here. Like you can bend this in and do this. You just gotta make sure you don't fall into this trap, right? Too much bend and then you're into what we call rubber hose animation, right? So you wanna mm -hmm. stay away from that too, right? Very easy to fall into that trap. Okay. So this is what we're trying to do, right? If I combine idea number one and idea number two, I can get some amazing folds. I wanna vary the distances and I wanna try to find the letter D or these lemon slices of force because it gives me some stiffness and it gives me the fluidity of the hang and the flow of the fabric, you see? So you don't want these guys, these are all symmetrical, that's why they're not good. Because remember, we're drawing the goop <laughs> with the lines. This just goes straight up and down. This gets pinched at either end and it gets pushed out equally on both sides, double symmetry. This squeezes in, which means it just explodes everything out. It doesn't have direction. This gives me a clear direction. And because it's asymmetrical, again, I can hook it up into the next forceful shape. And that there, that will let me create rhythm. So that's the secret in that. Not to sound too, again, grandiose, this idea is the multi-billion idea, billion dollar idea about what in animation we call appealing design. This is, all of Disney animation is built on this shape I just showed you, right? And it's funny, if any of you have the Illusion of Life book, it's like this two inch Bible for Disney animation. There's like this tiny little box on like page 260 something or other that talks about appeal and like straights and curves. And the entire empire is basically built on that, right? Huh. So here I am, I'm like, look, this is appeal. This is how it works. It's because we're talking about structure and motion, structure and motion. I've always yeah. thought about the line of beauty, which I got from Bridgman, but mm -hmm. I've never thought about it in terms of, of making a shape out of it and using like a, a D or a, a you know, 11 mm -hmm. field. I mean, it's really very, very, and I, you end up with, with full forms using, yes. using that. It's, it's really amazing. Yeah. I mean, someone like yourself, cause you know, construction so well, anatomy so well, and you just tweak the silhouette to see some straight and curve out of it a little bit more and boom, all of a sudden it clicks into this like shape, right? And then you learn how to get anatomy on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give a quick example of this, right? If I drew an arm, so arms are kind of interesting because it's so simple in a way, right? It's like, here's a deltoid and I go like this and then the arm to me is really a long curve and a straight. So there it is, right? Now we know the arm is more complicated than that, right? It's like, but, but look at this, right? Here it is. There's a shape, there's two, and notice I did two, four shapes here, right? The deltoid and the arm, right? But let's say here's the elbow right there. So now I say, well, I want like the brachioradialis. I can bump that out. It's totally fine. It's a little curve. It doesn't, it doesn't compete with this guy in the forearm. This is still the bigger curve. This is little. So the straight is still holding up there. But look at the silhouette, right? Notice what I did. It's like, ooh, that's, that's a step closer to reality, right? I could do that with the bicep and the tricep. I can bump a tricep out here and then cut it in nice and tight there. You know, I could put in the construction like this and say, wow, look at that tricep. It's going down to the elbow like that. I can have that deltoid wrap over. Well, look at that. That's starting to look like a sort of heroic um, arm, right? I could bring the brachial radialis, bring it over. We can get like the extensor digitorum. We can get the ulna in here and get all this other stuff. I can sweep. I can reverse the curve here in the hand and go, that's pushing down and here's a straight. And I got another curve to straight shape, <laughs> you see? And it all got built off of such a simple shape, but it's not incredible. Good enough by, yeah, it's, and I can I see how amazing. I, I like all that little detail. That's, you know, that's what I really like. Yeah. And I've never thought about just an overall flow and then being able to, you know, I, I, I learned so much from having Eric and Eddie on, and I feel like this is a real bridge to really understanding. Eric, would you agree? Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm very, very excited to try this. I think to me, I feel like I can do this. Like, I, I feel like this makes so much sense to me that I think I can just do it. And so I'm, I'm really excited to try it. Yeah. I'm scared now because you have a very strong style and a huge following and I don't want you to change that. <laughs> <laughs> you always have to try and grow though, you know, you have to try I and grow. I know, but they're, they'll all come back to me after this video and be like, you're <laughs> the one who made David change. You bring like more fluid shape in, how dare you? And I'll be like- I Yeah, I mean, what's, like, what's, what's great about it? You know, what's great about this arm, for, for example, is from the deltoid to the hand is, I mean, one could say it's straight, but it's not. Well, it is, but because of the rhythms and the opposing, 
you know, um, opposing a angles, it really makes it dynamic, even though it's, you know, quote unquote, a static arm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, uh, I think it also really helped in making, you know, my, my art for sure more dynamic and just trying to keep this in mind. Yes. Um, you know, mix, mixing those curves with straights and uh, even though it's yeah, seemingly yeah. At, at, at rest, it just feels dynamic. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, <laughs> but I'm still scared. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I would like to do it. You see what I mean? Like, and you know, to your point, because you're so awesome at the um, the inking of all this, right? The cross hatching and the information that gets in there. You just pile that stuff on this, right? You just throw it on, but it gives you this really powerful underpinning, right? That's that's got good design in it, and then boom, you can just pile and pile and pile and pile. You know. Yeah, and well, it, it, no matter how much detail you put on uh, a drawing that doesn't have any movement or any kind of uh, flow, it, it's still a bad drawing. Yeah, at least it has right. detail, you know. But uh, yes. and uh, I'm not the most stiff artist in the world, but it's just not something I've ever really thought about. Aside from my my technique for for not being stiff is just copying artists that do it well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but not really having an understanding of these kinds of concepts, and I I love that we're really getting a like a very um, simply broken down version of why that stuff works. And I think it's really going to change how I work. Well, osmosis asks, can that apply to fingers? Absolutely. I think um, yeah, yeah, some of uh, what David's instructional videos went with the posing curves on a finger. Yeah, see, like the flat, the top of the finger here is flat, uh, underside yes. curve. That That's adds exactly force. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you want to make sure you got that form in there. You can even put the bumps on knuckles and stuff like that. But I usually like straighten the top and kind of S the bottom a little bit. But you really want to make sure you got that. What I call this a turning edge. It's the corner, right? So you really want to get like that in there. You see? And I use fingernails. I don't care if, you know, here's a here's the end of a finger. Um, I always keep the fingernail. Let's say it's going away in perspective. So here's the knuckle. I'll always keep the fingernail going in the same direction as the form of the finger. You know, here's like the cuticle and stuff, but I watch this line right there. I won't, I'll try not to reverse it because if I can keep it on the plane that the finger is on, right? So here's the finger coming towards us and I put a fingernail on it. I'm going to do this and this, right? This line and this line to show it's coming out, right? Because here's like the front surface of it. I'll never go this way unless it's like a female with long fingernails, but even then some women they'll do long fingernails and they'll bring it out here and they'll still have it be this shape. I much prefer that because the perspective continues down the fingernail and the fingernail shows you the construction of the finger, you know? So I like that little trick, you know, it's like, yeah, I'll take I like anything I can get. <laughs> like that a lot. Yeah. All right. Let's see. So we're almost to the end here. Um, right so i just took you through all the basics of force force form and shape right and in the book that's like the whole first half of the book is like how did that all relate really to clothes and then we finally get to this piece where it's like hey every clothing book out there has fold types and i guess what i've added that's new is first of all i've changed all the folds i think there's seven in total total i made them all a letter because i thought iconography wise they made sense to me they were really clear um, and I also, this is my, my big epiphany in writing this book was, I want to see if I could find a system across the folds. So what I discovered was it really came down to those anchor points, right? So most folds, not most, some folds are one anchor point, like the letter I fold. I call it an I because it's a straight drop. So if it's a skirt, right? If it's on the curtain, like we talked about, it's a straight drop. It's an I, right? You can have eyes actually on diagonals. Sometimes you'll see that on like seams of pants, like through the pants. The point is they have numerous anchor points right next to one another and they just kind of cut through stuff, right? So that would be an eye fold. Uh, the second fold is also a singular point and that's the A fold. This is probably one of the most famous folds, right? Because look, it's when you have bent knees and bent elbows, right? Knees and elbows are where those anchor points are. Notice here, I did an applied force and I gravity one, by the way. Here, I was just like, I'm going to just hang stuff down. Here, I'm like, man, that, you know, that is really pushing out, right? I'm pushing this out. Here, it's tied up in the this like towel, right? So very, very famous point. Again, you see this a lot in, you know, comics, animation, illustration, really profound anchor point. And then last but not least, at least for what we're covering today, there's there's more than this. 
just only have so much time. <laughs> but this is the switch. So those are some of the singles. Here's our first double, right? Most books have called this in the past the diaper, which I always hated. I'm like, I don't want to be drawing diapers on like my superhero <laughs> character. Here's Batman and here's his diaper. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I don't want to call I don't even want to be thinking about diapers when right. I'm drawing Batman, right? <laughs> so so it's a two, it's a double anchor point, right? And that's the big change, right? So I want you all to be aware of uh, you know, the single right single and the double right so that i hierarchically purposely set up the book to go from singles to doubles and then the complication that occurs throughout them as well doubles get actually more and more complicated the first double as you can see here is the u because it looks like the letter u now if you had a sharper piece of fabric um that's harder like a canvas this u could become a v right because you could run into something that looks like this right like really crisp uh sharp corners on it you see so from a u to a v you can call it either one but it's in that space right and the singles are you know the i and basically the a and the difference there is the a flares sometimes it's typically because of the fabric um depend you know if the fabric's very thin or light then this can get to a more linear pull like that a more straight pull the thicker it is, the more it's going to create the A shape, right? Because it's because the fabric is stiff enough to try to like flare at the bottom and hold at the top, right? So something to keep in mind. Okay, so that's some of the folds that I thought we would cover today. There is more, there's more of them, but um, I want to cover some other stuff and show you some other assignments. And maybe some of those other ones will even come up in there. Well, and you know, also there's, there's the book. Uh, Force fabrics, yes. which you guys find, <laughs> yes. and it has so much more than we can really cover here. So uh, definitely, this go guy. there it is. Force <laughs> fabric, you can find it on uh, on Michael's website. It's mm -hmm. called. We have it. Drawing it's, it's a, yeah, yeah, drawing force. force. Yeah, and be, yeah, be sure to buy it there too because of the you know the coupon code that that rush is basically you'll get twenty percent off. So yes, uh, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, and you can see here on the cover, by the way, is a great example of what a lot of the illustrations in the book look like. So you'll notice this is full of information, right? Notice the purple, which is what form is. We talked about form before. Look at the blue, right? You start looking at this now with what I've shared with you guys today. Look at all the directional forces. Notice the anchor points. See all the green ones around the waist. Look at the orange and the shoulder. And then these, these are like these stickers that I created in the book. So there's the eye fold, that's its icon, and it's pointing to this part of the body to say, there are the eye folds. Here, this is an S fold. So that's one of the ones I was telling you about that we didn't get to talk about, here it is. It's a two point fold, that S is usually around a tube. It's almost like the stripe that David and I talked about across the leg earlier. It's like a stripe, right? The fold wraps over and around. It pushes down on one side, up on the other to get that form going. That's over here on her body, right? See the box there? It's going mm -hmm. around from the lats, right? From the side of her body and then around her waist. So, and then last but not least, and I'm gonna to get to this in a little bit, uh, this is a speedometer. So we'll talk about that in a moment. But this right here, the cover is a great example of once you get through all this information in the book, you start having these kinds of drawings show up with this much information in them for you to see how we've built up to this place where you actually understand what the heck all this means, you know? Uh, we have a super chat from Jim Klein for $10. Thank you very much, Jim. And he says, Michael, thank you for coming on the stream tonight. When the clothing book launched, I treated myself to the entire set of Force books. Do you oh my have a God. recommended thank reading you. order for them? Uh, yes, I do, actually. Um, here, I'll go to the pictures because that would be easier. I would recommend, if you have all of these, um, the following, right? Let's see. Let me grab a color here that's really bright so you can see. This is definitely uh, number one. And why is that not showing up? Hold on. Uh, here we go. This is number one. That is the foundation book. That's the one that started it all 20, over 20 years ago. And it's about figure drawing and force, some of the stuff we talked about today. I would probably from there go to, the, um, to this, which is a companion book to this. It's like more of this, but simplified down. So it's literally a companion book. After that, I would probably go to number three, which would be anatomy. Um, and then after anatomy, I would probably go to clothes. I think these are the first 
four that are very academic. Then you have sort of a choice. After all of that, you could go to number five, which would be number five is all about how do you push design, right? How do you even draw from reality and push into imagination? It's where you really, as an artist, start forming opinion. It's like, oh, I think it's like I did caricature for 11 years professionally on the side as a side job. Um, and it's like caricature in a sense, like, you know, everyone draws Batman different. I keep coming back to Batman, but everyone draws him differently. Like, is he really barrel chested and huge? What's the shape of the insignia? How do you draw his head? How long are the ears, right? Those are all proportional choices. Imagine bringing that to figure drawing with force. So it's not only proportion, but it's also the power of a pose and how do you dramatize it? How do you make a boring pose awesome? That's another thing that's in that book. How do you push it further, right? Make it more heroic, right? In fact, on a whole other side note, this is something probably mo most of you don't know about me. Um, I worked on Megamind, right? The DreamWorks film. The head animator, Jason Schleifer, uh, called me and was telling me they're working on this book of DreamWorks and it's going to be a superhero film. And he's like, I think your force thing would be awesome. So DreamWorks hired me to come over and basically consult, right? I taught force classes to all the animators that went on the film. And then I would redline like clips of the movie talking about force. So like, how do we make this pose even better and even better? You know, like how do we plus it, plus it, plus it, you know? So uh, that's what, a lot of that is coming out of this book, right? And last but not least, and this can come first if you love animals and I would say start here. Otherwise I would say this would be the last one, you know, because it's, it's a different thing, right? It's like oh, yeah. I'm drawing on this. Whole other can of worms once you get into animals. That's <laughs> in my experience. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, really tricky. I love that book in that I found a force body shape that works for all mammals. It's just stretching it, but there's a rhythm that works across all mammals. And then all you're doing is plugging on the different locomotive classes of anatomy in the legs, right? So that that's the big discovery in that book. It's like, hey, it's not as hard as maybe you think. Understand the flow of the body and then stretch. Like a giraffe is the same as an anteater, for instance. It's like just knowing how to do that and then just keep plugging on the different locomotive leg types. So it's like plantigrade, digigrade, and gulligrade. There's a three. And you learn like, what are they? How do they work? And so on. So anyway, great question. Thank you for asking. No one's ever asked me that. I have to say, not with me being in a session like this with all the books laid out. I would say that is that is the process right there. Thank you. Yeah, Jim's always got the he's always got good questions, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, awesome. All right. So we're coming in for a landing here, folks. Thank you for sticking around and listening to me talk for so long. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yes, it's very incredible. Thank you. Thank you. So I brought this in. Uh, here's a picture of a couple of Batman shots of Spider-Man because we kind of were talking a little bit about texture um, and tight and loose fitting clothing. You know, a lot of superheroes, of course, are in like these spandex outfits. So you don't really have to worry too much about folds. There are in like the knees, like you get the elbow behind the knee, you'll get some folds, maybe something in the neck, right? Very, very um small amount and they're really really tight and they're just like these tiny little folds in the book i call them o folds because they just literally wrap like a letter o around the object that is bending right so it'll, yeah. it's like stretched on the knee it's almost like an a fold but then it just gets tight around the back or if you wear something tight like a shirt and you were to like push the sleeve up you get all these o's basically right yeah now quickly we have a, a super chat from tomac art uh for two dollars, he says, "Absolutely love the Force books." Thanks, Mike. He also said earlier on in in the chat, he said he uh, met you in New York and got a bunch of great tips. So, oh yes, I, yes. I yes. wanted to say it, but I, I don't want to interrupt too much, you know. So I'm I'm trying to yeah. put a lot of the chat in the bottom, just on the screen. Yeah. But, so yeah. If Tomic is who I think it is, he was actually right there when you and I talked at the convention. I think he was at right at the front of the line. So thank you for letting me talk to David for a moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and he's very good. He's he's done some comic book work himself. He's very very good. Yeah. So um, so that leads me to what I was saying on the cover of the book. The reason I brought up the Batman and Spider Man is there is a page in the book that talks about speed, right? And I talked to you about force before, um, and how you know it's like this kind of line, right? So this takes us all the way back to the beginning. Well, one of my metaphors for when I'm drawing force is like driving a race car, right? So because anything that you can take that has trajectory um, is energy. It's got force, right? So if you're riding a bicycle, if you're on a skateboard, you're driving a car, they all have force because there's movement, right? You're getting from A to B over a certain amount of time. It's very much a physics idea. So when you're drawing force and you do this, 
and you were driving a car on the freeway and you're going 100 miles an hour and you hit this curve, you better be ready to take on the slowing down of that because you're forcing the car to change trajectory and an object wants to go in a straight line, right? So that's very different than if I just do this, right? This is pretty straight and easy, right? I can go 200 miles an hour, no problem. So this idea that, that I teach in figure drawing with the force line, I brought that over to close basically. So this is a speedometer. And I took that because I talk about driving all the time. And I said, this here, that is a slow fabric because I can't drive through that tiny little corner fast. I have to like stop the car and then take off again, you see? This one's in the middle. So this is like a canvas, very crisp cornered, right? This is a denim. So a little bit of a softer corner, I speed up the speedometer and like something like silk or something very flowy and loose, very open curve, high speed, right? Super high speed. <laughs> so you'll find that in the book as well, like in all those little stickers. And, you know, Eric brought this up, David's brought this up. This is how you differentiate, man. You really want to get sophisticated with clothes. And what you could do is look at the folds, right? The corners are where a lot of that uh, texture occurs, the texture change of if something's crisp and angular or does it feel thicker and rounder and heavier, but fluid. Now, line, this is a whole other thing, but line does it too. So I could have something that's flowy, but heavy with my line or have something flowy with a thin line. Suddenly this is like a thick leather and this is something really thin, right? So the line thickness can determine the, the thickness of the clothes. And then the curve is determining the, um, the crispness of it or the softness of it, right? The hardness or softness of it. So you got two kind of vehicles going on there, right? Line mm -hmm. thickness and sharpness and corner. Right. And you combine those two things and all of a sudden you have like a million options. Right. Someone like Line Decker, for instance, I don't know if you guys know Line Decker or David, if you talked about Line Decker, but Line Decker, everything was angular. Right. So he just made everything crisp. It looked like everybody walked out of a dry cleaner. <laughs> right? And I love it. It'll look great. But yes, it was definitely a, a real uh, style. Everything was drawn that way. Painted. Yeah, that way. that's right. And, and it developed his style. So I'm talking about reality here, but as an artist, you could definitely say, man, I want everything crisp cornered or I want stuff round. And there's artists who create entire careers based off of that, right? Because they just figure out the way that they like to draw. So everyone's everything's thick and round. The people are thick and round, the clothing's thick and round. Line decker was, you know, line decker was the dry cleaner of art. It really was. Like I always used to describe this when I taught in New York as literally iron out the bumps, right? So I would tell students, if you saw something on the body that looked like this. I'd be like, get this down first, right? Boom, boom, boom. Like see through the noise, right? Right, see through the noise. So I used to say to them, take an iron, here's this iron right here. Here's the handle, old fashioned iron and go over this and find out the core of it, <laughs> right? Later you can put bumps back on it, but find out the core. It's almost like the shape thing we did before with the arm, right? Like find mm -hmm. out the core. Um, Okay, so that's what these mean. So if you buy the book, that's what this stuff means. It's me talking about speed of fold, basically, right? All right, so um, I brought in a, a bunch of like just fun reference. Um, I thought maybe we could do some drawing and then I have some couple of last things um, to share with you guys when we close up. But let me just go through these pictures really quick here. Now that we, you know, I brought a bunch of Batman stuff in here. He's kind of been the one I'm focused on today. There's a couple of other things in here too, but if we start analyzing these, it's like, look at what's going on, right? Uh, let's go to swatches here and a layer. Okay. So we got swatches. It's like, you know, he's pulling from over here, right? We have a gravity force anchor point here. What kind of fold is it, right? Well, here, let's do the pulls. Here's the pull, right? Here's how it pulls. Well, what kind of fold is this, right? This is an A fold right? Because it went like this. It started from an individual point and it flared out and then it's going to go over his arm, right? So like the tube of his arms here, it's going to wrap around. So we want that wrapping because that would give us roundness. Here's, let's say if I put mm -hmm. a drop shadow on there, you'd see that roundness, right? But that's kind of interesting, right? These folds, these really tight ones, that's what I was calling old folds before, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the ones I, I probably do the most because I do so many 
uh, tight costumes and just that little bit of detail gives it a little sense of reality. Really quickly, uh, we have a question from uh, Russ Hicks, our moderator. He says, Michael, ha have you needed to align your concepts and nomenclature with proper physics over the years or has it stayed firmly based in a visual domain? Um, mostly visual. I have taken my own little journeys into like physics just to make sure I'm not really breaking anything. And it kind of educates me in that it's like, oh, I can talk about friction, for instance. When you're standing, like this was something I never really thought that much about, but when you're standing and every gravity's pushing, you know, pulling you down to the ground, physicists will also say, well, force is pushing up against your feet. And I was like, wow, I never thought of it like that, right? Like there's two opposing forces happening at the same time that help you stand on the ground. The object is pushing force up against you and this is pushing down. And that kind of blew my brain open, <laughs> you know? But it's mostly just me. I. I've learned to be just really sensitive to, I think, how things work from a physics standpoint. And I feel like my job is to help share that with the art community as to how, do, how does that get translated into line, basically? How do I take physics, define systems that actually create this in line work, right? And be able to bring it over so it makes sense. To me, again, drawing is la it's language. I might as well be teaching you French, right? It's like, I'm teaching you drawing. Right. And here's the language I've learned over the years and some of the fast tricks you've seen, like the thing with the arm and the shape was me saying, well, guess what? Here's how a paragraph is built. Right. I showed you the line. That's the alphabet and the letters. But I'm like, hey, look at this really great way of building a paragraph. Then you could flower it all you want with adjectives and adverbs and so on and make it sing. But here's the quick foundation for it. Right. Yeah. Put the topic sentence, put the other three in there, close up the shop. <laughs> You're done. Right? Jimmy Ramo, Ramos asks, will this video be deleted after the stream or will we be able to view it later? You will be able to view it later. Don't go away, though. <laughs> <We'll be here. laughs> yes, don't go away. Exactly. So here's, you know, old fashioned. This is one I grew up with, by the way, just to age myself. Yeah, I used to love this show. I always loved when Batgirl would show up and you'd see the little animated motorcycle at the beginning and you knew she was coming on. <laughs> All right. So fun. Here's a cosplay costume I found. So what's going on here, right? It's like, okay, this is, uh, we just have two gravity points, right? We got one here, we got one here. We have the hanging that's going on like this. It's like, what kind of um, bowl type is this? Oh, this is a U, right? Now you can see the smoothness of the fabric held it at a U. As it's up here, it wants to fight. You know, let me go white here. It wants to become a little bit of a V. You can see there's just... As it gets smaller, it's getting a little bit of sharpness, but the weight is so much heavier down here, right? That it's just kind of curving it out and curving it out, right? So that's kind of an interesting idea. I would normally have not thought of that. It's like, mm, certain fabric might change from a V to a U based on how close the fabric's points are to that fold, right? It could manipulate it, you know? So that's kind of an interesting little thing. Yeah, well, in smaller folds, I guess would be affected by gravity, they would weigh less. You know, yes. So that, that makes yeah. so much sense. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Those folds, they they aren't just simple U's. So it won't start at one side and, and go all the way down and form a U shape. They actually interconnect. Mm -hmm. so they do down here. Yeah. And right. I, I've never, I, so I understand how to draw that. And I have a real, like I have a technique that I use to do that. Mm -hmm. But why is that? Why does that happen? That's a good question, right? Like, let's look at it and kind of analyze it together. I mean, why does it break up, right? Well, I would guess that the first reason is notice that these folds up here are starting closer together. Their anchor points are closer together and we're starting to go further apart, right? So you'll see if we look at the home of these guys, if I follow this, it's actually getting to here and it's got a very wide connection point. Mm -hmm. These are little eye folds here on the other side, by the way. And then this is a cleaner seam. So it opens it up. And that opening, I think, is making this very wide. So it's not holding on to like a crisp, nice, round, like tubular fold anymore. So I think it falls out of the pattern of what was going on up here. And this side, it looks like they're trying to insinuate that this guy is standing with his elbow coming towards us. I think this is coming out. Yeah. So that's like a new anchor point, right? So it's like, oh, this is here and it's going down here, but it doesn't have it doesn't have a clear partner on the other side anymore. Right. You know? Okay, yeah. You see what I mean? I do. That, that I totally understand that. Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. I, I, and the, you know, David and I didn't rehearse this. I don't even have this in the book. I'm literally just winging it here. I'm just analyzing. I think that's what's happening here, right? Like yeah. the, the home base has changed and there's no real clear, you know, road from point A to point B on the U anymore. So all of a sudden it's opened things up, closed other things up and they kind of, they kind of start stepping here like this, right? Instead of like this, like you said, and to your um, awareness, right? They're not a clear you anymore. Mm -hmm. They're real. You know what they actually become, which is another fold in the book. They're almost becoming like a J fold, which is this. You see, mm -hmm. right? Because it, it it ends. Not to get too far into J folds. What's interesting to me here is the J folds in the book, the way I teach it, J folds usually go from a single anchor point at the top. And when they go like this, they wrap, right? So there's like a tube here and it'll go like that and wrap around. So what's interesting here, it's not wrapping, but it's hanging. And then it really has almost no strong, easy home on the other side, right? It almost feels like a second a second coming of the J fold. <laughs> yeah, two J folds and then yeah, uh, opposing and then mm -hmm. they just meet as they meet and mm -hmm. it's okay uh, I, yes so you can do this and this right and then all yeah. of a sudden you go into use and then you get into these and it's like there it is and such a much more interesting s series of folds than just the same shape all the way down which uh is the natural tendency to do if you don't really understand that which yeah yes, <laughs> so yes. yes. No, it's you're you're 100 percent right. Remember the stuff we talked about with the curtain and all, and I talked about contrast and affinity very quickly, and that's that's like a whole other conversation. That you could take that rule rule and throw it on anything, basically. That's how big it is. But our minds, uh, you know, I've been teaching for 30 years, and I don't know why this is. I'm not a therapist, but our brains, I think, find comfort in repetition, right? You like centeredness, repetition. That's where the human mind wants to go for peace. And your job as an artist is to go, nope, I'm gonna cause chaos, <laughs> right? I'm gonna cause chaos, why? Because it's way more interesting to look at, you know? So, and it's more organic. We make bad art when we allow our brains to say, everything's gonna be calm, I'm just gonna keep repeating the same thing over and over. It's the real sign of the amateur, quite frankly, that ends up falling into that trap. Mm -hmm. You learn your way out of that. And then if you want something symmetrical, that's fine, because you're doing it consciously. Not subconsciously right. because you're out of control. You're not. You're not doing it on purpose. You know. Yeah. So, so yeah, I agree with David 100%. This this gave us you know one, two, three different types. I would be aware of the spacing in between them, the length of them, right? All that other stuff. And something I didn't talk about before. I want to make really clear before I forget. Um, form on this stuff matters a lot, right? It's and David's awesome at this, right? And that is making sure that this stuff feels like it's doing this right like it, maybe it goes like this and then like this maybe this one goes in and then around and this one goes in and around maybe this one goes like this and then bows out like that right so it's like all of the form that goes into these tubes of these folds right you see how i just push this all into perspective right mm -hmm. it's that shape and form thing we talked about with the box and the ball i just made some lines and some shapes but there is the structure Right. And that's what makes things super massive and solid. And you can see that in the lighting on this guy. Right. But if you're not a renderer, you don't want lighting. You do with line, you ink it. Right. You can, you can sculpt some of the structure into it. You know? uh, all right. Let's keep going. Like I said, we're coming, we're flying in. So I, I grabbed these, like I said, cause I want you guys to start seeing what I'm seeing. It's like, without me now marking up, it's like, Oh, this looks almost like a bunch of eye folds actually, but there are varying degrees. It's not as clear as on some other capes, which you're gonna see in a few moments, like A folds. This one, a lot of, they wanted a lot of hanging. Whoever the costume designer was, like they do this on purpose, right? It's like, I want all of these bands, but they're varying widths, right? Mm -hmm. Notice the collar on this version of Batman, how stiff and round that is. So it traps all of those like eye folds underneath it in certain locations, right? The way it's, it's built, right? Very interesting. Here you can see that again, that same thing happening, right? You can see all the separation that's going on in the costume with that very stiff collar. This is me as Batman a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> just throw that in there. There you go. Just thought, just thought I'd You're welcome, it. everyone. Just, yeah, I just want to scare the crap out of you for a second. Just make sure everyone's awake. <laughs> yeah. This is um, 
our, you know, loving uh, Christopher Reeves version of Superman. So I grew up with this guy, right? His word, Lois Lane passes, right? Super dramatic. But notice the costuming here. So this is like an A-fold, right? Everything's coming together and then it splays out, right? So very neatly done. It's pretty tight along the back of the neck, right? But it's all coming out of this corner in the front on either side. So we get this nice A and it, it opens itself up across the cape. So I started looking at this. I was like, hmm, I wonder if all the Supermans have done that, right? It's like, let's look at the next Superman. Oh, not here. Here, they created this cape with a very stiff rim around it. So it almost prevents a lot of folding at all, right? And if it's going to, there'll be very wide folds, almost like it's happening on Lois here around the side of her body. You'll get these very big, wide folds because they're not pinched. There's no pinched moment, right, at the top. They're not crunched together. So I was like, okay, let's keep going. Here's the most recent version. Well, look at that. That's a total throwback to Christopher Reeve, right? They did the same thing again, which is cool. Personally, I think that's really cool. And it looks good. It's stacked neatly. I don't know if I'd call that an I or an A. I still think that's really an A. They're stacked, but they're stacked in kind of V shapes. They're not stacked in perfectly straight lines. You notice they taper and go wide and taper and go wide the way they've been. It's almost like pleating. Right, they've been yeah, like pleated. Like, okay, I was gonna say like sculpture, but yeah, like pleating, not just mm -hmm. a natural fold. Yeah, yeah, no, not natural by any means. To your point, you know the uh, the Kryptonians liked their uh, their pleats. <laughs> right. Yeah, look at the costuming. How tight it is. Right, it is so damn tight. There's barely anything in here. There's a couple of little folds here. So I would call these old folds in a sense. Again, they're just really tight little folds in the like in the armpit there. Right. Yeah, super tight. And then I just had to throw this in here because this is my favorite Superman movie ever, ever you know, in film ever. I, I love when he's the bad guy and he's like shooting peanuts at, in the bar and then he has this fight with himself. It's like freaking amazing. <laughs> All right. Underrated classic scene. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, so good. Any of you that have not seen this, I know like Richard's Pryor's in it. Like what did they, what were they thinking? <laughs> they put in comedians in like superhero movies. And Russia Pryor's great, but not in a Superman movie, right? But this was he awesome. was better in some other. You know what? I I loved him, and it's true he wasn't the best in Superman. I still liked him though. Mm. Yeah, I just don't want him in here. I want this. You know, I love the. I like more. I'm not. It's not like I don't like comedy, but I love the. I love the live or die situations that happen in superhero movies. You know, I love the well, drama. And, and it's yeah, the chance to put yourself in the position of you know. What would it be like to be Superman? And it really is. It's a fantasy. Uh, yeah. That's the appeal. And so, yeah. you know, making too much of a joke of it is a risk. You know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. I love what you said there. I love the, the idea. You know, it's, it's the fantasy, right? That, that's what we get to live when we watch these movies to get a taste mm -hmm. of what the heck is this person going through, right? And a good film will give you a taste of that, you know? Yeah. So here's my version. Yeah, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is going back six or seven years, but this is my fast go-to costume for the holiday, you know, for Halloween with my kids. I used to just throw on a Superman shirt and like a, a dressy white shirt and a jacket because I'd always have glasses on like these. That's it. Like, I'm going to come over and I'll do Lex Luthor. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. That would be so awesome. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So I forget apologetically the name of the artist that you said this was. Was it Brett that's Booth? It. Brett Booth. That's right. Yeah. Brett Booth. So I, I originally thought this was McFarlane, and you can see Booth here did a great job of emulating um, McFarlane. And I, I wanted to bring in something like McFarlane-esque because he took fabric to the 10th degree, <laughs> right? He just went like over the top, just like he did with posing for, you know, comics and Spider-Man and so on, right? And, you know, Dave and I were talking about this earlier, and it's like, there's, this is an A-fold, by the way, right? So everything is emanating out of his hand, right? We have all this pulling. Here, he's just making shapes. They're good shapes, by the way. There are lots of straights and curves, right? So very good appealing shape design. But it's so fictionalized and yet feels real because of his sense of like the folds. Mm -hmm. And he, he gets to a place where, he, as David was talking to me earlier about it, he started using it as like design element. And it's like, wow, that's a whole new level of genius, right? It's like, let's forget about the reality here. He's got a taste of reality, but he was just like, bam, I'm going to design composition with this too. And that was explosive, right? Totally explosive. 
So I anyway, can't think of anybody cool. doing it to such an extent before Doug McFarlane. I think of Norm Brayfogle, who did it beautifully with Batman. Uh, that was the 80s, I think. Um, 80s. And I want to say that that was before McFarlane. So uh, yeah, probably. I that way. But uh, yeah. Doug McFarlane, uh, he really certainly popularized that kind of really, really dramatic not real, but just informed enough by reality and, and the rules that you're talking about to make it work. Yeah. I mean, McFarlane, let's, you know, let's admit he's, he's a man of extreme, right? He had Spider-Man, he came up with like new web designs that were all over the place. Spider-Man was making poses that would break the rest of us in half, <laughs> right? And then he moved over to Batman. He did some Batman. He's moved over to his own IP uh, with Spawn and craziness right it's like and it's cool you know i have to say it's cool i think it's cool to to break the mold right and it's what made mccrawling mccrawling and last but not least our all-star favorite <laughs> hey yeah i brought in some of david's work to show you like wow look at the amount of work that david's putting in here to get these folds right so this in a sense is interesting right look what you now now that we know more about what we talked about here today with it you have a lot of these like wrapping so these would be almost like o's around the fist and then you have a giant A that's splaying out to the tips of the cloak, right? And you use it as a design element, right? We're just talking about design. It's mm -hmm. like it really set you up with the black, right? With that light coming out of there. And then his head kind of peeking over that. And I, I love how you inked the, the black against the white here to really stick his, you know, make his face pop, you know? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, really great. There's a lot of great stuff going on in here, right? Here's, I love when superheroes grab the damn cape man there's like nothing better than getting a fistful of cape <laughs> yeah you know, i will say um that picture is very heavily influenced by kelly jones i'm a huge fan and it's not a copy <laughs> it's not a copy mm -hmm. but the idea of having the cape come forward like that a lot of that was really heavily taken from kelly jones so yeah no it's great give yeah. credit it's where great to have your inspirations right yeah yeah no it's awesome this one too i love like the thrusted forward like pose right the machismo of this is really awesome and then again you can see a lot of a folds right again holding it so a lot of a's you know a is a very good fold to fall back on when it comes to um to capes you know especially if you're going to have like a single place that everything is emanating from so you can see that david's doing that here and you did a great job if now based on all the conversation we had today right look at the randomness in here so you did a great job of putting in the work of making this organic. It would have been so easy for you to be repetitive, right? I had that point hammered into my head working for Mark Silvestri uh, at Image mm. Comics. And not just Mark. I mean, there were so many great artists there, and, and we really shared information. And like you said just a minute ago, uh, every new artist comes in and just naturally wants to uh, be symmetrical and, and you know, pattern, basically. So yes. I, yeah, I had that that knocked out of my head pretty pretty early on working there. Yeah, it's great. It's great, you know, and that's what makes this feel more real is the artist's choice of breaking that down. It's one thing in the belt because it's handmade, you know, it's man-made, it's machined, right? It should have the repetition, but the cape is something that should be random. And as an artist, it actually takes more work because your brain does not want to do that, <laughs> yeah. you know? So that's pretty cool. All right, and the last but not least was this one, All right? So again, really cool. I love the big upward pushing up here, right? I like all the sweeping that's coming down. A lot of great rhythm in this one, right? I like how heavy this feels. It feels like a beast of a cape, right? Like he's carrying around with him. And you got a lot of nice flow going on in here, right? We got the rhythm of here to here, right? So great fluidity. And you use it as a backdrop, which I really love. You know, it's like it's a stage that like his body is sitting on. And I like that you broke the silhouette. You know, you again, uh, great job of the like black to white back and forth. You know, you obviously know how to, you're a master of black and white, right? So it's like recognizing where you lose edges and where you want things to pop forward. And, you know, I've never heard you say this on your streams, but I'd be interested to hear your thought on this. Um, you know, how much do you care about the light being right? And how much do you cheat the light to get the pattern to work for you or, uh does it, you know, and, and where, where do you sit on those two things? I'm a hundred percent willing to cheat the light to make it work. I mm -hmm. do care about the light though. And I want it to, what I want is uh, for things to generally have 
if there's a light source, I want to make sure to never have a shadow just directly in that that light source. And I want it to be consistent that way. So it's it's a consistent light and dark. But then if I'm going to create a shadow that's going to obscure part of the picture that will make it confusing, I'll just I'll cheat that shadow. Mm -hmm. uh, there are times. Um, it's, it's so difficult to describe, but I'll have uh, like an arm sticking up. I probably shouldn't be doing that. You know what I mean? No. <laughs> I'm sticking up and um, the shadow underneath it coming from a certain direction would, would shadow this whole part. And then I'll have right. a shadow on the face. If I shadow one of those consistently with the other, one will be way too dark or, you know, vice versa. I, I don't know if I'm explaining it the best and I'll just cheat them. So, so they work together. Even, you know, here's my, the best example I can think of. I'm going to go into mm -hmm. detail about shadow. I'm so sorry, but you want to draw? I think of, that, I really that... like the nice heavy shadow under the nose and under the mouth, and you mm -hmm. lose a lot of the mouth, and it's you know you get that really dramatic feel. But what I don't mm -hmm. like is a shadow from the chin all the way down to the chest, and you lose the entire neck. Sometimes yeah. I like, a lot of times I don't, and so I'll have heavier shadows where it works, lighter shadows where it doesn't, within mm -hmm. reason. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, because I have learned I'm not a I'm not a, a big renderer, but I always think of light. I know that there's obviously the render side of it, and like you said, I think you always want like a clear light source, so there's no crazy rule break because it breaks the reality. Mm -hmm. But then I love when I see guys like you pattern this stuff out, you know, and recognize that you're you guys are doing that. I think it's really cool to have white stand against black and black against white and black and white and black and white, you know, and then. How much noise is okay against an edge like that versus having to go really, you know, bold with a black or a white? And I just love the artistry of that. I think it's just such an awesome thing, you know, to be able to do that. I mean, like it, going back to Miller really quick, like he did that a lot with Sin City. He went like to the extreme of it was, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way in that it's almost like freshman year of college, meaning black to white positive negative shape right but then how far he took it right like how far he pushed that black to white design right and he like patterned stuff out and it's like wow look at how far you can take this idea right so awesome mm -hmm. yeah for anyway sure. he was yeah, such so, a master at it yeah masterful masterful at it mm -hmm. so here to close um uh, you know and you tell me dave we have the time so we're already at like eight, eight or eleven for you right um, yeah, yeah, we uh, we actually um, this has gone so much in depth that two hours have passed. Like, I can't believe it. I just looked at the clock right now, and I <laughs> had. More I know that's what I just. Said. I was like, oh darn, we're already at, at eight my time. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't want to. I don't want to try and keep you here all night. I know. Uh, you know, we all. I'm okay. To stay a little time. longer. I just wasn't sure about you if you're okay or not. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's. Um, I just wanted to go over, you know, we were talking about assignments before. Um, another great assignment is to have a model like this. So this this comes with that. This is part of that um, drawingforest.com model pack. So this is Trinda. And you can see he's a great model. He's like super fit and he's dynamic. I just grabbed something that I knew can give me some really clear um, anchor points, right? So the assignment is imagine taking some clothes and like trying to throw it on the model, right? And use the stuff that we've learned so far today. So you just go through the steps, you know, it's like everything we talked about and just take your time. It's like, what are the first things I see? I'm like, well, that's going to be an anchor point. That's going to definitely be an anchor point there. Usually elbows and knees. I would say shoulder is lifting up there. Um, where would green be? Well, probably the belt line, I think, is green. Maybe up here is green. The stuff maybe just hanging from there versus being pushed there, right? Uh, anything else? I would, oh, you know, I might have gravity here. Like I said, the whole belt line pretty much. I think outside of that, there's a lot moving here, a lot of movement, right? So if I were to start drawing that, right, let's take a layer here. Oh, I was gonna move, I don't know if I should bother with the moving of the camera. We've done the whole thing like this. Maybe let's just yeah. stay like that. You okay with that? Oh, I, I think it's really working, yeah. Okay, okay, great. Whoops, I wanna do this. Okay, so I got this. And it's like, how do we start dressing him up? Well, man, look at those pants, right? They are super loose and flowy. So I purposely grabbed them because it's very clear, the fabric of it all, right? And how they work, right? So I'm gonna abstract this here. I'll use blue just to talk about like how this stuff all connects like we did before. 
So I'm going to abstract this and like, how do I, how do I make this start to work? I'm going to start here. For some reason, I'm very attracted to right here. It's like, I like that this is going to like crunch out of here, right? And definitely st stuff's going to fall here, right? It's going to fall here. It's going to be sitting up here and fall from here like this. This is going to fall straight down and probably because of the fabric fall, I would say, to the back of the leg, right? It's going to hang on this because if this was a cliff and we're thinking about physics, right? And remember, gravity is pulling straight down. It'll sit on top of that thigh. It's going to sit on top of this thigh, right? These are like the plateaus on the body. His shirt, which is also pretty loose and flowy, except for the arms, but the chest, that's going to hang off the back there, right? It's going to sit up there. It probably, based on like the shoulders, it looks like there's moments in the shoulders here. I think here we'll get a lot of this hanging. In fact, based on how crazy this cut is here, there would probably be this giant triangle that we see here. You see that? That triangle will probably cut its way through here, probably drape over that leg and make its way even around the corner, right? His arm is pretty tight. I would say we'll probably get some old folds in here. I'll probably get some pull. It's pretty tight though. So I think this anchor point, unfortunately, won't do a lot for me with hanging, but I'll, I'll try to make sure that I get pull along the back, pull along the bottom. If he pushed his sleeve up, I'll have more O folds like stacked up over here like that. I would have that on the other arm as well. So that'll give me good form. Um, the shirt's relatively snug in here. It feels a little tapered like this. So mm -hmm. I think this will give me mostly roundness in here. And then we got that piece that's hanging. So I'm going to guess, let's say if I had a seam in here, I'm going to say that this is going to like hang over the middle like this. And then, like I said, hang off of his body. Uh, here it's going to hang. So the loose pants are going to want to fall off of here. Now they can only fall so far because of how thick or how wide the pant leg is, right? They, it's not like they're going to be here and like that. It's too big, right? So my guess is this would probably fall off of here, maybe to like about this width, right? Like it's going to fall off the butt and it's going to want to hang, right? Over to the knee, like so. And then, like I said, here it's going to hang. Right. And then here it might crumple up a little bit. We might have some folding there and then it's going to make its way down the back. So this is my diagram, right? I'm just abstracting ideas. I'm like, I think it's going to be like that. I got some seams. Maybe I could put a seam in the clothing here. That would be great to give me some roundness. The belt line, I'll probably see it over here underneath that triangle might be like that. Right. The edge of the pants, right. Especially with the shoe um, with his foot pointing down. This will probably just be nice, loose folds, right? Here it's gonna crumple up, by the way, and then it's gonna open up in the back, just like this one. So there's my schematic, right? It's like, I, I've done a schematic of this. <laughs> now, let's kind of start trying to draw it, right? It's like, well, it would sit on top of this. I'm gonna give myself a seam here. I'm gonna say that this will probably pull off of here and be pretty tight to the elbow and pretty tight this way. And then I would bump all this stuff out. So I put that line in there, but I would probably bump this all out over time to get these, um, these O folds to really like work in there. And you'll see it smooths out in the upper arm. So I'm going to keep this smooth and say most of the wrinkling is here just because he shoved it up his forearm a little bit, right? And then I would do that here. Now, when you do O folds, by the way, to be really fast about this, you know, it's like letter O, letter O, letter O, right? You're drawing ellipses basically, right? Like this. So you'd end up with this bumpiness on the sides like that. And then you can go in there and just kind of put in these, these little seams, right? These like eyelets that are like this, right? To kind of break that up, because that's what happens. I'm getting into all the fulch types here, but an O fold is basically, basically a compressed X fold. So these are X folds, which we've seen, right? You see on your jeans and your pants all the time, right? They're like this. And then they have like these mouth shapes that kind of fit in here like this, right? And you want to keep that kind of very abstract too, right? And if I add dimensionality to it, it's going to start looking like this. You see what I mean? So that's an X fold. So what I'm saying here is an X, an O fold is a compressed X fold, right? If you have those bigger folds and you shove it up your arm, you're compressing that. And that's what's creating these little, these little eyelets here. It's these shapes right here that get squashed in. So I would put that stuff there, right? So here we have this hanging of the shirt, which is hard to tell what, it seems like it's coming from here. So I'm gonna go over and around the arm and say it would probably hang about here. I can't see what's going on on the side. So I'm kind of guessing that maybe this gets to like the center or maybe it wraps all the way around the back. And this'll 
very quickly probably drape over his leg. There'll probably be some folding over here like this, and it's going to hide, right? Because like I said, it's going around. So that's going to disguise that, which kind of stinks, actually. Yeah, it's a shame. That was that was your your main starting point. Yes. So let's get rid of it, <laughs> right? <laughs> let's get rid of it because I agree. I don't like that, right? So let's do this. I think there'd be some pulling here. I want this here. Um, I'm just going to make believe we don't have that loose triangle. And let's put some um, some kind of subtly open O folds in here. And I really want this. I want this in the pants. I want this in the pants. So that's giving me two directions for the folds. I'm doing this and doing this right next to each other. It's two different directions of form. It's like the hip versus the leg. And I want this leg to kind of hang down here and get me over here. And then we'll have these loose folds that are the compression side of the A. So the A is here. It's going to hang down, right? Usually you have some big points like this from the knee where this will hang. Probably some smaller ones on the side, right? It'd be something like this. We have the anatomy sitting here like this, so it might be something like that, right? Um, you'll have these folds that emanate from here, from the A, that are kind of those X folds I was talking about that are getting compressed back there, right? So those are like that. This would probably be tight to the body, right? Because you can see this is pretty um, thin, smooth fabric that's going to cling to the figure, right? So I would say that'll hang. We have this, uh, you know, here you would put like the crotch line would be in here like this. That's a great center line, by the way, right? Notice he's not wearing a belt or anything, so I could use that. I'm going to curve down and then up over the hip here. Um, I'm going to say that, like I said, the pants here are going to hang from here, right? They'll probably create some folding like right here, right? And they get down the calf. And then here, I think we're going to be on the edge of the thigh and then we're going to hang, right? Hang like this. And this might pull to like the back of the shoe or the back of the heel, right? Something like this, basically. Barely any anatomy shown in this, really, especially in the pants, right? Because they're just so loose. Mm -hmm. um, what else? I, I might put some inking line or some pull lines in here to show that. Um, you might have something along the back here that might pull from the back. Or if there is a seam here, you might have little eye folds that are just like right next to each other like this, like pulling around that like that. You can push on the O's as well to kind of push more into that if you wanted to. And then we'd have that neckline. If I built that up, we could say, well, it's a high neckline. I want it to give me form. Right, there might be a couple more folds sitting in there. But this is a great exercise. The idea is take a model, grab some different outfits, tight fitting, medium fitting, loose fitting outfits, and try and see if you can dress them up. Right. It's like try and see if you can go through the different fold types, find those anchor points, and start to see how the clothes hang. You know, I really feel the pants on this one. Those knees are really helping everything get to the knee and just like fall, right? Like water, right? It's like dripping off of his knees, basically, you know. Any um, thoughts or anything, David? I, I I feel like this is so. When I draw anatomy, I, I have a, a system, you know, especially when I'm really doing it properly, and that is to draw my basic wireframe figure, put my muscles on it. I use the Bartier's method, which is you know circular, mm -hmm. circular kind of shapes for muscles. I develop mm -hmm. from there, and I have a system for that that works, and I feel comfortable with with mm -hmm. clothing folds i really don't and so i just start drawing folds you know and uh, i've gotten better at it over the years but it really is just a like it's a bit haphazard the way that i, I think about it this is really constructing folds in the same way that i construct anatomy mm -hmm. it's giving it an anatomical and a, a firm um Definitive structure, you know, that it, it also with with so much movement that you have too, that's a whole other thing. But I just I love that it, you know, I can I can base it on a real structure. I understand the different types of folds and I can start to differentiate them and why they happen. Yeah, I think it's it's a really huge help. Thank you. You know, you uh, obviously as a professional artist, you have the hard stuff down, like you know how to draw, right? So you got form and anatomy and all that stuff in your back pocket. So this is just like adding another layer to sit on top of that and say, well, let me just be aware of these anchor points and that there's different fold types. So at least I have awareness. I have awareness of anything, right? And that, and then that gives you the variety, you know? And then you can talk about like what we did before with the folds and making sure things don't repeat. But to your point, I'm, I'm trying to generate systems that I think anyone can pick up, right? And go, I get this. Here's step one, here's step two, here's step three, here's step four. And suddenly I have somebody who's close, you know? Uh, yeah, uh, it's 
<laughs> I, I'm struggling to think of exactly how I want to describe it because it, it's just I've never really thought of uh, uh, folds in this way. And I, well, we were talking about this earlier. I've done videos on on drawing folds, and I feel like there's some value in them. I mean, I've got my insights here and there, and the things that I've learned over the years. But there really isn't a system. Uh, and you'll see that when, if you watch any of those videos or if you have seen them, you know, you guys that are watching. Yes. Uh, and I, I don't think that y you can beat having, uh, having your body and then thinking in terms of, you know, gravity and, and, um, I'm going to draw a blank trying to think. Like, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Having full types and fits, right. like thinking about all those systems, you know? Well, it's the the points you have the the orange points oh, and the, the points. Mm -hmm. yes, and I'm like, see, I need to read the book, I, and I need to watch this again too. But um, yeah, being able to work with those points and then and construct things like anatomy on top of it, uh, and then you know just like anatomy, and it's so similar. Mm -hmm. You can learn anatomy, but to really you know get a, a real stylized feel for it, whatever that happens to be, whether you like. Uh, you know, a Ryan Otley style, which I'm really into right now, or you like whatever artist it happens to be. Same thing with folds. You can go with something like a real, you know, lion decker, something really crisp mm -hmm. and hard edged, or you can go something much more flowing and, you know, Disney like, and it really depends, but it, it follows the same rules. And this is really that rule set. And I think it's invaluable. Cool. So, Thank you. Really, really great. I want to say also that uh, before we go again, uh, in case you guys are coming in late, and just as a reminder, if you've been here the whole time, and thank you if you have, uh, yes. that you can go to uh, Michael's website at forcedrawing.com. Uh, the drawing force. Yes. Drawing, drawing force. force. I'm so sorry. That's okay. That was always a dilemma. Do I want to call it force drawing or drawing yes. force? I still, here we go. I still contemplate that. <laughs> we have Russ to the rescue here with Get Force Fabric here. 25, 20% uh, off. If you go to uh, Michael's website uh, over ordering it on Amazon, mm -hmm. and you also can go there for mentorships and um, um, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Michael. You, 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 you <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think there's a few people already from the stream who, have, who are have signed up or are going to. So um, it's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, they're they're, exciting. they're pretty excited as well to uh, to be able to learn. Yeah, so. As a quick overview, there's sort of the two areas of the site. There's like memberships, and they're typically like monthly, almost like a Netflix situation. And then the ultimate of membership is elite, which means you sign, you pay once and you get full lifetime access, right? The deals I came in with today to help you guys out and hopefully inspire you to learn what force drawing is, uh, is there's standard membership. It's $30 a month. You get access to force, form, and shape to those courses. And I'm throwing in the brush pack, which I've been using here digitally, and the model pack, which you saw the photo from. There's 550 pictures in that. That 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 op those options together are $27, which means for your first month, if you pay for a month of standard membership, you're paying really three bucks, right? So you're getting you're getting you know a $30 package with $27 worth of bonuses, basically. The bigger deal I tried to come in with tonight, I, I was originally just going to come in with that, and like that's not really enough. It's the first time I'm here with David. I got to really give you guys something amazing. <laughs> so the big one is if you sign up for mentorship, which is really what I try to get people to do more than anything, because I know from the seven or eight years now that I've been driving drawingforce.com with mentorship as part of it, is that's where you're really going to learn. If you really want to learn how to draw, you want to get better, you want to get a career in comics or animation, whatever it might be, mentorship's where it happens, right? So one of our packages is 36 sessions, but don't go to that on the website. You can go to it and sign up. That's fine. But the link that we're sharing with you today will take you to a very special membership package where there's an elite bundle, which means that membership I talked about before that's elite. That means after you're done with mentorship, whenever you're done, it could be six months, it could be five years, whatever. It's totally up to you. You will always be you will always have access to all of the content on drawingforce.com. As long as I'm alive and that site is up and running, you will always have access. You'll also get access to any new stuff that comes out. And I was, I was telling David earlier, we have a lot of new stuff coming out this year. So it's a great time to get that elite membership. And there's lots of other stuff that gets attached to that. There's so much, there's so many, there's like hundreds of videos on the website. We have a force discord where we teach people on the discord every day, just like little tricks, you know, you can post your artwork there and get some feedback there too. 
Right? But, and but mentorship is, yeah, and ment it's just that mentorship is the crown jewel. I just want you mm -hmm. all to be aware of that. That is the crown jewel. You know, if you really want to learn and you're serious, because I'm dead serious about it, if you want to really learn and change and create a career in art, you want to go into mentorship. You know, like that's where it's going to happen. It's going to get real. You know, I have yeah. lots of people that work in the industries from comics to animation and video games that I have taught over the last 30 years that have gone in like as sometimes as artists and then become directors, even executive producers. I had one guy, he was the head of um, new IP for Netflix, right? For the animation division. So like, I don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> I just taught him how to draw. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, I got my start uh, at Top Cow Productions, and I learned under Mark Silvestri, and that was really a mentorship. I, I wasn't Mark, ready. Too. He's mm -hmm. so great. Yeah, and he was yeah, a great team. He was player. one of my faves. I wasn't ready for work, and mm -hmm. I got hired knowing that, really. I got hired as an intern, and it mm -hmm. was learning through a mentorship. I don't know where I'd be without that, and it, it does make yeah. such a difference. I feel like the videos that I do, are, I hope, are a really good resource, and they can they can help a lot. But having that immediate feedback from somebody that really knows how to take a look at what you're doing and see yeah. the mistakes and help you with it, it makes such a big difference. So I highly, highly recommend it. I hope you guys check it out. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you so much, uh, Michael, for coming on. Thank and you. This. this has been really, really amazing. Uh, I can you. tell just from the, the chat that people have really gotten a lot out of it. I know I did. Eric. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mike. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, uh, yeah, for sure. People in chat have been loving it. And um, I'm pretty sure there's going to be some folks from this chat chat spilling over into yours. I think tomorrow you have a, what is it called? Force Fridays. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so thank mm -hmm. you for reminding me. So we're live. I'm on the West Coast, so I think it is on West Coast time. But we're live um, every Friday. In fact, I was telling David earlier. Tomorrow's our 193rd Force Friday, <laughs> right? So we've done 193 weeks of this Force Friday, and we are on at 12. 30 Pacific standard. So obviously if you're on the East coast, we're talking about three, you know, three 30. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we go for an hour, three 30 to four 30 or 12 30 to one 30 if you're on the West coast. Um, tomorrow, I think we're talking about expression and the eye and like understanding that whole system. Like how does that all actually work? Right. And it'll, and it's in my, my world of like, force, form, and shape, and how did all these things come together to deal with expressiveness and the eyebrows and the eye shapes, the eyeball, the structure, the shape design, the energy of all of it. What does it mean, right? Like, what are some of those expressions? That'll be tomorrow's conversation. So yeah, check it out. Uh, there are, like I said, there's 193 videos to look at there. So there's a ton of content. It also gives you a taste of what we do at drawingforce.com. So where Tunjay is there, Swenley is typically there also. So you'll see who the other mentors are because the three of us all teach. Um, and you'll get a taste of who they are as personalities also and their skill levels because they're, they're pretty damn amazing, I got to say. you know. Well, that's great. And thank you again so much. So yeah, hopefully uh, you guys will be there uh, tomorrow to check that out. So uh, yeah, I hope everybody has a great weekend. It's Thursday, right? Weekend's coming up. Yes. Losing track of time. So yeah, yeah. hope everybody has, has a great weekend. Thanks for spending the time with us. And uh, um, thank you again to, to Michael for coming on and, and uh, giving us such a great show. This has been incredible. Yes, thank you. And thank you guys. Again, thanks for sticking around with me for um, this uh, this session. Thank you, David. Thank you, Eric, uh, yeah, for you. you know <clears throat> figuring this all out and making sure everything's working. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's it. Yeah, I'll All see right. you guys around. I'm looking forward to your new uh, videos, David. And uh, yeah, we'll talk soon. Take care, All guys. Right. Yeah, thank you. Good night, everybody. Yeah, good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.